Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brookline School Committee meeting of August uh, 12th. You've been here a lot. You've been with us a lot, so we appreciate it. I know that uh, you've been very busy writing emails, calling us, and then speaking tonight. Uh, so tonight, we're going to uh, listen uh, to the public. We have public comment. We have something like 45 speakers lined up, so we really are going to hold it to the two minutes. Uh, as one member said, we listen best for a minute and a half, so if you might make it shorter than two minutes, that's fine. We have a lot to get through. We want to hear everybody. We want everyone to have a chance, but we still want to have plenty of time to uh, go over the proposal and the plan and to deliberate that. Uh, after the public hearing, uh, Dr. Marini will present the, the latest with the plan. Uh, we hope to have uh, a motion and deliberation on that plan and then to have a vote. And after the vote, uh, there may be a little bit of other business. I think Capitol has a little bit of business for us. Don't let me forget. And then we will go into executive session. So I just kind of wanted to lay out the evening for you and how it's going to go. So we will begin with public comment. Again, please limit it to two minutes. If you were saying the same thing as somebody else, it's okay to say ditto to them and uh, thank you and, and move on. So, I mean, we do wanna hear you, but we do have a lot of people. So uh, just keep that in mind as we, as we go through this. So I will call the first name up and then I will call the name, the person to come after that. And, uh, and we will keep doing that as we go through the line. So our first speaker is Russell Seidel, and the next person will be Lindsay Litton. Can you hear me? Yes, Russell, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide input on the school reopening plan. So I speak today as a parent of a rising Driscoll second grader, but also from my perspective as a university educator. While this professional experience differs from K-12 education, it is sufficiently analogous to have informed my stance on this question. I would like to advocate for the position expressed in the August 10th meeting, which calls for a fully remote reopening and transition to hybrid learning as specific benchmarks are met. To me, this strikes the best possible balance between incommensurable choices, namely ensuring the physical health of our students and teachers, supporting the professional and financial needs of working families, and fostering a learning community within our schools. A guiding principle that animates this school committee decision is the intention to put, quote, social emotional wellness at the foundation of student success, unquote. Efforts in this vein are best accomplished in a physical classroom, and I've seen Brookline educators succeed brilliantly in this task while observing my son's development. However, the reality is that in-person education during COVID involves schools where students and teachers are largely masked throughout the day, where social distancing eliminates physical contact, and where legitimate teacher concerns for their own safety insinuate themselves into the classroom. This is not to gloss over the many issues with remote learning, but to point out that any in-person model during this pandemic will necessarily be an impoverished version of its preceding form with implications for the social emotional wellness. Taking both the above and the guidance from the state of Massachusetts as reported in the Globe this morning into account, I would specifically advocate for continued focus on classroom ventilation and physical infrastructure as extenuating factors in forming our reopening plan within this broader state position. Having these and other protective measures in place prior to a wider scale reopening will ensure that in-person schooling, when it comes, it's sustainable within the particular circumstances that make Brookline Public Schools so unique and so valued by all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Russell. Uh, Lindsay, I don't believe is online yet. So Heather Pinot, you are next, and then Alisa Connor. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Heather, I'm, go ahead. I'm Heather Pinot. I'm Heather Pino, the French teacher at Lincoln, and I'm here to support the Remote Plus plan. Thank you for listening and for putting health and safety first. I fully recognize that this plan is not one with which everyone is going to be happy and that everyone will share different kinds of burdens. Remote Plus, however, gives us the most flexibility to focus on what we know we will need, the remote learning piece, while providing us additional time to plan how to incorporate additional in-class components as and when it becomes safe to do so. This is not going to be the same educational experience that we all want, nor can that be the expectation. We need desperately as a community to overcome the lack of trust, the anger, the hurt, the fear, and to recognize that we all want to do well for our children. 
We all want students safely in school. We all want to reach all of our learners. Last spring, the opportunity to collaborate with colleagues, both in my building as well as across the district, was one of the biggest gifts during this challenging period. Remote Plus gives us the opportunity to continue this work. We are in unprecedented times, and the only way through this is if we all, as a community, help each other. School committee members, please approve this conceptual plan, even without all the detailed answers and 100% agreement, which we will never have. Continue to work on the safety of the buildings and to provide resources for us. Provide funding so that we can hire more staff to support all learners and for online tools. Central office administrators, please give us clear and timely direction about expectations and what next. Curriculum leaders, please continue to support and advocate for us. Principals, please come together to create a united plan, particularly around schedules, so that we have time to collaborate with colleagues throughout the district and then help us by clearly communicating regularly with families. Teachers, we know what we have to do, so let's work together with our administrators, school committee, and with the support and understanding of the community to reach all of our students to the best of our ability during these extraordinary times. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Elisa, you're next, and then Jennifer Stone. Okay, hello. Um, thank you so much and thank you for all the super hard work. Uh, I'm a Spanish teacher at the high school since 2001, a single parent of a rising seventh grader at Lawrence and BHS class of 1990. I, like every single teacher, desperately want to be with my students together in person. And for my own kid, he desperately needs more structure and in-person contact with other supportive adults and peers. For him, it's actually a life and death situation. He really struggled with remote learning and is currently in a severe mental health crisis, the life and death kind. And even so, I'm not willing to risk the health, safety, and lives of my students, their families, and the whole community by rushing to in-person learning. It's a matter of when when we have detailed, thorough, workable plans that take into account the many, many complexities, which we haven't even begun to address as a community. These include, not limited to, bathroom use, hallway protocols, figuring out which teachers have to teach remotely. I cannot safely leave my kid home alone in a hybrid model. So how many teachers are available for in-person teaching? Therefore, how many do we need to hire for the in-person instruction? Are there even the funds or the time to get all that in place by September 16th? What about funds and supplies for PPE for all educators? Somebody talked about protective eyewear in the last school committee meeting. Will that be available for me? What do we do if the buildings aren't ready with the proper ventilation by September 16th? How do we make sure we have access to frequent testing and quick results? Because if I have to self quarantine for two weeks, multiple times in the fall, because I have symptoms, who, who's gonna sub? So, so much gratitude for all the hard work so far, and logistically, we're not there yet. And in this case, some of the logistics are actually a life and death matter. So as a parent, I have to figure out some different kinds of supports for my kid in September, while we as a community figure out the real plan, and that's what Remote Plus allows us to do. We are a well-resourced, creative, compassionate, smart community. We can partner to figure this out. So I urge the school committee to agree promptly to a transparent, productive, opening bargaining process with the union as soon as possible, because we can do your remarks. You're, you're over together. I'm all done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Jennifer, you're up next, and then James Murphy. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Jennifer. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, my name is Jennifer. I have two children at Florida Rough and Ridley School. I support bringing our children back to the classroom. As you vote today, I ask you to consider the following. You've spent many hours of your time discussing and negotiating the reopening of schools with a focus on safety only as it relates to opening the doors this fall. But this narrow focus neglects the more substantial need for schools to be safe, period, for all students for all years to come. The discussions thus far are all reasonable, but they don't lead to the larger arguments for safety in our schools long term, such as treating classrooms like communities in and of themselves, empowering teachers to creatively counter the problems they face during in-person instruction, communicating within those communities with great care to ensure kids, parents, and staff know what to expect, 
and how to identify areas of concern and solve them, how to be open about contacts and possible exposures, what to do, how to quarantine, and how to move forward, not when to close down school again. I haven't heard discussions about testing within schools to know when and where the virus is present. Random group testing, for example, appears to be a reasonable step toward management of COVID-19 cases within a small population. Also testing along with a comprehensive plan for looking for, identifying and quarantining groups or classes opens the doors long-term and could sway us away from more fear-based conversation in which science seemingly supports all sides and it could give us strength and resilience. A focus on more than fear that we'll get sick fear that school will close again, fear that we're blindly walking into the future. It will give us information immediate to our community, and that information is power. I want my kids back in school, but if the focus is just trying to cram in some in-person instruction before another shutdown, that's not enough, and that's not healthy. Our kids deserve schools that flex and change to accommodate everyone, even when that seems impossible. The example that would provide to our children has to be worth something. I urge your vote today to carry with it the promise of seeking solutions to keep our schools open rather than continuing to rely on remote learning. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, James, you are up and then Amy Lindenboy. I know that the school committee and Superintendent Marini face many big questions this evening and have a lot of difficult problems to solve. Here's one more that should actually be pretty easy to resolve. Hundreds of local students are planning to take the SAT on August 29th at Brookline High School. I'm not telling the superintendent to hold or cancel that test, although it's worth noting that next year, 61% of four-year colleges will be test optional, including UMass, Harvard, and MIT. Colleges are waiving the test requirement because more than half the seniors in the country who would normally have taken the SAT by now have not yet been able to do so thanks to COVID-19. What I'm asking is that a decision to hold the SAT be reached tomorrow. That decision should be posted tomorrow on the Brookline High School website and shared with the community and the college board so students do not spend the next two and a half weeks preparing for a test that in all likelihood will not happen. 31 high schools in Massachusetts have already canceled the August exam, including Wellesley, Framingham, and Lexington. BHS was actually the last school in the state to cancel the July ACT, leaving a lot of families sitting around wondering and waiting. Let's not be last again. Students and families will get some relief if they know this week whether they will be able to take the test. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Amy, you are up, and then Joanna Messing. Um, this is Amy Lindenboim. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you for your service during these very difficult times. Um, I guess the, the three main points that I would like to make. Oh, I'm a um, town meeting member in um, Precinct 5 and the parent of two children at Lincoln School. Um, we heard this afternoon in the school building department meeting that they expect the ventilation um, that they've ordered and are working on to be finished in all classrooms ready to go and 40 tents set up on September 16th. Um, that's my first point. Second point is that <clears throat> Governor Baker has stated that the case rate in Brookline is too low to justify a remote remote only schooling. Point number three, um, Provided that ventilation benchmarks are met and all other new safety requirements are in place and reasonable accommodations are made for various vulnerable members of our, of our staff. I believe that denying in-person education in September, particularly for our youngest elementary students, will mean denying them a chance at a real education. My concern is that without having any kind of reasonable health metrics, and accepted standards in place, we have no guarantee at all that we will ever go back this year, no matter what the actual health environment is. So I urge you to return to the plan that was presented to everyone 
last week at the least, where K-2 would go back in person. That is entirely able to be done with the current classroom setup. And um, that we would work on getting everyone else in uh, on a hybrid basis, at least um, at the earliest possible time. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, Joanna, you are up, and then we'll have Lindsay Litton after Joanna. Yes, hi, this is Joanna Messing. I'm a parent of a rising seventh grader. And um, I also spoke at the last one. And I, I just want to really, really thank the school committee for all of your consideration here. I couldn't agree more with um, what Heather and the other teachers said. And I just really want to thank you for putting forward the plan that you're voting on today. And as a parent, really encourage you to vote for it. It puts the safety and health of our community first and enables us to really think carefully about how and when we might reopen. So I really encourage you to vote for that remote option today um, so that the teachers and parents can prepare for that remote learning opportunity and um, really prioritize the safety of, of our students. And I deeply empathize with those families who are in crisis and hope that as a community, we can come together to find creative solutions for those families that are really struggling with the remote option. But um, today, please vote yes for the option that's in front of you and thank you. Thank you for all the time and energy and thank you to the teachers um, and thanks to everybody. Um, that's it. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, Lindsay, you are up and then we have um, Andrew Shallot. Thank you. Um, my name is Lindsay, and I have three students who go to the Florida Rough and Ridley School, and I also am a paraprofessional at Brookline High School. Um, I want to thank everyone, including the school committee, the district, everyone for coming together and trying to come up with the best solution for our students, for our children. Um, I know the springtime was a mess, and nobody was expecting that to happen and things were all over the place. But I do want to give a lot of um, points to educators that I'm sure by this point in time that they have been able to come up with a safe and a very um, good plan for the students to work remotely just for the safety of our students, for the safety of our educators, for safety of anyone in any of these buildings we see that this virus is not settling down anytime soon. And I, as a parent and as an educator, would rather the safety of my child, knowing that my child is coming home alive and safe, instead of risking their life day by day, knowing whether they're gonna come home or not infected with this virus or any other child or any other teacher. And I ask that you guys vote to start remotely Let's see what happens. Let's see how this goes. There's only one way to find out, and that's if we try. And I understand the hardship for parents, and I understand that because I'm a single mother myself, but I know as parents, we will always find a way to make sure that our students and our children are always taken care of. And I just ask that you guys vote to make sure that this stays remotely, that we have safety for everyone in this town. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Andrew, you are up, and then I believe Lance Zhang is after Andrew. Thank you. My name is Andrew Shallot, and my daughter is a rising fourth grader at Pierce. We absolutely should not reopen Brookline schools before we're ready. We need the PPE. We need adequate ventilation and air filtering. We need teachers and staff trained on new routines, and we need community transmission rates to stay low. But once those pieces are in place, we shouldn't hesitate. We shouldn't wait another day to reopen our schools when we can. I expect some kids will do fine with remote learning, and that should always be an option. But let's not fool ourselves. This is an experiment, and many, many kids won't learn anything in a fully remote program. I recently spoke with a wise Brookline teacher who'd been leading an outdoor activity group. He said, it's tough. In a school, if a kid runs out of the classroom, he's still in school. But here, if he runs away, he's gone. 
What will Brookline do about kids who get frustrated, bored, or distracted in a fully remote program and just close up their laptops? What will they do about the kids who watch YouTube videos while school plays in the background? Because you're not with them. They're not in school. They're gone. I understand the fears and concerns about reopening schools. There's hard work to do to reopen in person. Luckily, our expert panels have done a lot of hard work, and that needs to be communicated better to the whole community. We shouldn't shy away from more hard work. We can stay safe and we can reopen our schools. Please put a plan in place to do that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Lance is up and then Jennifer Mathis. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I am the father of an incoming kindergartner. And since the previous speaker mentioned Georgia, I just want to emphasize that the Georgia and Massachusetts are very different. First, the infection rate are much lower in Massachusetts. Second, why masks are mandated in Massachusetts, Georgia is actually suing the city of Atlanta for its mandate on wearing masks. So I think the key question is, is it safe enough to send teachers and kids back to school here in Brookline? So roughly six weeks ago, I asked myself a similar question. As my wife and I debated whether to send our two children back to daycare, we knew the risks. First, hours long, 8.30 to 5.30. Second, kids don't wear masks in uh, daycare. Third, teachers and kids have less than one hour of outdoor time per day. And when inside, teachers and kids are often within three feet of each other. And fourth, the daycare doesn't have the newest filters. Last, most teachers commute to work. Despite those non-ideal conditions, I'm happy to report that five weeks into daycare reopening, not a single teacher or child was infected. And my five years old is happy at daycare, even though the experience is very different. And the teachers that I talked to are also happy. I think I can share later with the community what Bright Horizon, which operated daycare, did right to create such a safe environment. And it turns out that Bright Horizon used the same practice throughout the pandemic to provide emergency childcare for essential workers, sometimes in old buildings. Therefore, I am optimistic that the public school of Brookline can provide a safe environment for both teachers and kids at the beginning of the school year, given that it's only five hours per day, not nine hours given that teacher here at Brookline will wear masks and given that there will be enough space for teacher and kids to be six feet apart. Thank you. Thank you, Sejong. Um, next is Jennifer and then we'll have uh, Natalie Linos. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Jennifer, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Nixon Mathis. I will be starting my 25th year in Brookline as a physical education teacher at the Ruff and Ridley School. Thank you all for allowing me to speak tonight and for all the work you have done. I am here tonight to voice my concerns about the fact that we still do not have a K through 12 wellness curriculum coordinator. Our coordinator oversees 40 wellness educators across nine schools. From the presentation on Monday, on slide 14, for preparation of Remote Plus from August until September 15th, it states, the curriculum coordinator will work with staff to refine expectations and curriculum for remote learning. Who is doing that work with the wellness department? On slide 31, it says, more specific and intentional physical education when students are remote. Who is going to ensure that that happens? Who is going to create smooth transitions in wellness education for students and staff between the different models? The bottom line is the answer to all of these questions is that regardless of what model is chosen, none of them will meet the high standards that our students deserve without a curriculum coordinator to guide us. As a veteran teacher in this department, I need a coordinator in order to do my job to the best of my abilities. The health and safety of our students is our number one priority. Who will streamline communication about new safety protocols to protect all of the staff and students? After listening to all of these meetings, the one thing I keep hearing is the lack of equity that occurred during the spring. I can tell you without a coordinator, the inequities across 
our department will be very significant. Not having a curriculum coordinator will affect every student in the town of Brookline. Currently, we are the only department without a K through 12 coordinator. This spring, under the leadership of Carlin Wayunama, she pushed us, pushed us to develop websites, teach synchronously, set up meetings weekly, which will in, include mindfulness training led by Amanda Grindstaff. Please We've, conclude your remarks, you're over two minutes. We then implemented those skills in our remote teaching. She helped us think outside the box and to meet all the needs of all of our students. Carlin was the glue for our department and without her, we would have been a team without a coach. Starting the school year with a remote set plus setting without a coordinator is taking a step backwards in an already challenging time. We need an experienced leader for this department and I'm asking you to please reinstate this position immediately so our department can start preparing for whatever is decided so we can give the students of Brookline the best wellness education they deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Natalie, you are up and then Celine Selim. Thank you so much. And uh, my name is Natalia Linos. I am a mom to a second rising second grader at Pierce. I'm also an epidemiologist. And while I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist, I've been following COVID very closely. And I'm glad that Massachusetts has managed to bring down the rates so dramatically. And I personally am in favor of in-person for the younger ages. And let me explain why. First, I think that this isn't going to be the case necessarily for the entire school year. There may be times when rates will go up and we'll have to shut down. But at the moment, we're doing well. I promise to join with other parents to push for Governor Baker to close indoor dining, to shut down gyms and other non-essential you know, uh, businesses so that schools and teachers can be safe. I hear the worries, but we have September, October, November where outdoor instruction is possi possible because of the weather. If we lose this narrow window of opportunity and don't get the littlest ones, the kindergartners, the first graders, the second graders into a school routine, they will lose the entire year. My seven-year-old who finished first grade still doesn't know how to read. And it may be because she has a learning disability, at dyslexia, which unfortunately I am not equipped to assess. And having her out of the classroom, I worry. I worry about her and her classmates. I worry about all kids with special needs. And I think that in-person can be possible because we have good public health data right now. In the future, if we need to go to remote, we can and we should. The metrics should guide us, not fear. And I worry for everyone, but I also worry about the kids who are staying home unsupervised. I'm worried about parents, including myself, who work full time, who will not be able to stay in the workforce. And I worry that we need to have a solution that works for students, parents, teachers, and that you're in an impossible position because the governor hasn't shut down indoor dining, but we should get together as a school community to say schools must come first and in person will work better for so many of our students who can't learn remotely. They simply can't. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Um, Celine, you're up and then Jeffrey Neal. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can, go ahead. Hi, my name is Celine Salam and I'm the parent of four kids in the Brooklyn schools, rising grade K and seven at Heath and 10 and 12 at the high school. Thank you for the opportunity to talk today and thank you uh, for your hard work. We truly appreciate our Brooklyn teachers and care about their safety. I support the previous in-person and hybrid plan because it took into account the fact that youngest kids do not engage in remote learning. My six-year-old son won't spend more than a few minutes on Zoom, so remote is simply not an option for his age group. I do have a question. Is the plan to switch to in-person learning for K-2 to two and hybrid for higher grade as soon as HEPA filters are installed in all the schools? Or is the plan to have remote learning until there is a vaccine? I am truly concerned that if we don't start with some in-person component in September, the schools actually won't reopen until 2022 or later, as we have no idea when or if we will actually have a vaccine. We have to learn to live with COVID as it could be here for years to come. If we don't go back in person, but in late fall, when flu season starts, the combination of both viruses will make reopening schools close to impossible. The fact that most European nations, some with higher death rates than Massachusetts, safely reopened schools in May and June, and that COVID numbers going down is very encouraging about the safety of reopening. 
the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend reopening with masks and other precautions. Brookline Rep already brought back about 250 kids safely and successfully in person inside three Brookline schools for the next six weeks with zero COVID cases. We cannot afford to make important decisions, paralyzed and blinded by fear, but need to make them based on the facts and data we have. Transmission rate in Massachusetts is very low and death and hospitalization are down 90% from the spring. The death rates uh, up to age 44 is the same automobile accident. Why don't we have older and immunocompromised teachers teach remotely and the younger one in person? Equity and fairness gap will become greater as many parents will create private parts, hire children and quit public school to attend private schools. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, Jeffrey, you are up and then Bradley Coleman. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Thank you to uh, Superintendent Marini, the school committee, and all the expert advisory panels for your incredibly hard work in making this near impossible decision. My name is Jeff Neal. I'm a father to twin boys rising kindergartners at Heath and to a near three-year-old boy as well. I'm also a pediatric emergency room doctor, and I've been shoulder to shoulder with COVID during the pandemic, likely caring for some of your children. I fully supported the decision presented last week for in-person learning, particularly for our youngest students. K through two students can wear a mask for six hours a day, but they cannot learn to read or be engaged through a computer screen for six hours a day. We must not let fear override science and data. On Monday night, a school committee member quoted a news article about transmission in a Georgia sleepaway camp where test positivity rates are much higher and masks were not worn by campers. My boys went to eight weeks of Brookline day camps during which the Massachusetts test positivity was 2%. There were zero documented cases of COVID. I urge you to listen to the evidence reviewed and collated by the advisory panel for the evidence that says children are A, less likely to contract COVID, and particularly those zero to nine are less likely to transmit COVID. B, there have been safe reopenings of schools in other countries where initial community spread is low. And C, that children are experiencing increasing rates of anxiety, depression, and obesity, as well as underreporting of child abuse and neglect from extended school closures. There will never be zero risk, even with a vaccine, that is simply not practical. I truly empathize with teachers. We were scared too when we had to go back to the hospital wondering whether or not we might contract COVID or bring it back to our loved ones. But while the fear is real, the science is too. And we know so much more than we did back in March. So I urge the school committee to vote for in-person learning, particularly for our youngest and most vulnerable students because it is evidence-based and it is safe. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Bradley, you are up. And then Nema Shroff. Thanks. I'm a scientist, an educator, and a parent of an incoming kindergartner, second grader, and fifth grader. I know that remote learning does not work for kids in this K2 age group. We need to get those kids into in-person school as quickly as is safely possible. My concern with the phased-in approach is that we know there will never be a situation in which everyone feels comfortable phasing back in. So if members of the school committee are going to support this plan, please include clear metrics for progress under the supervision of expert panel number four. That is exactly why we have the expert panel. They've dedicated their professional lives to understanding these difficult questions. For them, these are actually not unprecedented issues. So please trust these experts, listen to their guidance, and pin the reopening of the school buildings to their evidence-based judgment. I want to end on a personal note. I know this is a scary time for the teachers. Many of you are worried about the prospect of coming back into the classroom in the middle of a pandemic. I understand this feeling. My wife is a social worker at Beth Israel. Normally, she helps patients deal with things like a diagnosis or their housing insecurity, but in the spring, she found herself on a COVID floor, dressed head to toe in PPE and working with COVID patients. It was scary, and it was definitely not what she thought her job was going to be but she couldn't just leave those patients and their families to wrestle with this situation on their own. And importantly, the hospital worked hard to make the environment as safe as possible for her. And so she went to work every day, did this new version of her job, and those patients and families got the care they needed. So I understand it can be scary to go into an unfamiliar situation that feels dangerous. Many of us are being asked to step outside our comfort zones whether it's my wife, the social worker, a bus driver, a supermarket clerk, or teachers. I respect and appreciate the challenge and the uncertainty teachers feel, just as I did for my wife and do for all the other workers who never thought of themselves as on the front line, but have stepped in to continue doing their critically important jobs. 
We owe it to you to provide a safe working environment. The good news is that we already know how to do it, and we have a panel of experts to tell us when we've achieved those safety goals. So I hope that you'll trust this process and continue to play your critical role in our community as we welcome you and our children back into the schools. I look forward to celebrating your dedication just as we've celebrated it for those other workers who've helped keep our society working for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Nemet, you are up, and then Tal Kennett. Hello. Yeah. Um, I wanted to speak today to express my views as a parent to an incoming kindergartner. My daughter attended the BEAT program last year, and for her, the online experience simply did not work. We've tried other online classes besides BEAT, and none of them have worked. Uh, we find that our daughter gets distracted easily and does not have the attention span to absorb what's being taught online. This has been our experience with several on online courses, and so I want to emphasize that our experience is not a statement about the quality of instruction provided by the teachers, which is generally excellent, but rather a five-year-old's inability to learn in an online environment, like many of the parents uh, have, have already expressed. Now, I understand and truly appreciate the risks of in-person classes to teachers. I'm an instructor myself and will be teaching in person this fall. So I am especially sensitive to the fears and risks being imposed on instructors. However, my university is taking steps to ensure that in-person classes are conducted safely. This committee has even recommended that pre-K students in BEEP be taught in person, which suggests that in-person teaching is feasible to do safely. Just as the committee would not risk the lives of kindergarten teachers, I do not believe they're risking the lives of BEEP teachers. So then I feel a great sense of disappointment that a child, that a child a year or so younger than my daughter would benefit from in-person education than my daughter and other other kindergartners or first graders would lose a year because online classes just don't work for children their age. While we can aspire for a low risk system, I want to emphasize that zero risk is simply unachievable. Not now, but very un unlikely even many years from now, even after the vaccination becomes available. As a case in point, even today people die of the flu, which clearly shows that zero risk is not achievable. Assessments of risk are subjective in many of our day-to-day -day activities, like driving a car, going to the grocery store, dining out, entail a lot of risk. In some cases, might be even more than providing in-person education to, the, to, to children. So I really hope the committee would consider having the youngest learners be taught in person, uh, just as they are recommending the pre-K students to be taught in person. I really appreciate your time and everything the school, the teachers and committee members are doing for our committee. None of this is easy and we wish none of us were in this position. Uh, but I, but I, I, I thank you for your time and, and for your attention. Thank you, Nimit. Uh, Tal is up next and then Gilly Navai. Hi. Tal uh, Kenneth Pierce, parent to a rising first, second and fifth grader here. While I truly appreciate the intensive hard work that went into putting together the revised proposed plan, as it stands, it lacks benchmarks as well as ways to assess these benchmarks. I'll focus on the two most crucial ones in my opinion. First, safety. To be clear, no parent wants to send their kids to a building that doesn't meet COVID code for safety. And I would never ever ask a teacher to walk into a building if I didn't think that building was also safe enough for my own child. As it is now, there are no benchmarks in the plan for what would be deemed safe enough to phase in the hybrid model. We're so lucky. We've got the world experts on epidemiology and healthy buildings advising us. I believe some of them will actually be sending their own kids to our buildings. Thanks to these experts, we know the benchmarks. The community rights for opening school buildings have been determined. The Capital Subcommittee, along with Matt, Charlie, and others in the town have been working ridiculously hard towards meet meeting healthy building benchmarks even today. Why are these benchmarks not integrated into the plan? How many rooms in a school building will need to be COVID grade ventilated to trigger K to come into the building? First grade. Without these specifics, it's not a plan. It's just a hope. Second, we need benchmarks to assess the success or failure of remote learning for individual students. I doubt that anyone on this panel seriously believes that the proposed remote plan is even remotely realistic for a K student or a first grader, unless a parent or a tutor is with them 100% of the time and most likely not even then. 
my own case student used to hide under her bed to avoid remote school. And her teacher actually put together a fabulous, genuinely awesome remote curriculum. It just couldn't be delivered under her bed. This plan does not outline what to do when, not if, the remoteness, not the curriculum, fails some to be determined subset of students. I know attendance will be mandatory, but if a first grader isn't attending or an a parent or a tutor isn't available to help, what then? Do we fail them and make them repeat a grade? I hope not. What about a fifth grader, a ninth grader? What is the plan for these students? I know the devil's in the details, but we're better off knowing the devils in advance than being taken by surprise by them. Thank you. Thank you, Tal. Uh, Gilly, you are up, and then Laura Ger uh, Gerald. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, everyone. I hope that you're aware of the protest that was against remote learning earlier today. I'm a life a science researcher and a health worker. I'm also a parent of a 9 and 11 year old student in Ridley School. I'm here today to say that kids need to be in school. It supports their educational as well as social emotional development. That is known for ages. None of these can be achieved in a fully remote learning model as we parents and students have all experienced in the past spring. Our children have been majorly impacted by the isolation that was enforced upon them. These have been long, these have long-term effects. We can all see the changes in our kids' behavior. Our kids deserve to be properly educated. Our teachers are excellent in in-person teaching. That is what they had mastered, and this is why we chose to live in Brookline and pay high taxes. Remote learning for elementary school does not work. Look at the survey results. It necessitates parent intervention and supervision. How families with two full-time working parents can support their kids' remote learning? We either need to pay for tutoring, babysitting, or losing our jobs. Where is the equity here? We all know that temporary solutions will become permanent. If schools are not open now, they will not be opened in the forthcoming year. We know that we are in a rolling situation. We know only what the present holds. Numbers are low now. Schools need to be open now. And a continuous assessment has to happen. Please focus on planning that and not on creating plans for scenarios that most likely won't happen. Please take evidence-based decision and look at the numbers that are specific to our community. Look at camps and preschools that have opened month, two months ago with very much success. It is challenging, but can be done. Please also note that they report that concerns prior to opening were much different from the actual challenges. I pledge you, give our kids the stability, the feeling of belongingness, they need so much, a reason to wake up in the morning and something to look for when they go to sleep at night. Remote learning does not give any of these. We are all here because of our kids and for our kids. Please remember that when you vote. Thank you. Thank you, Gilly. Uh, Laura, you are up next and then Boaz Wasserman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to speak and for everybody's hard work from the school committee and all the task force. My name is Laura Jarrell. I'm a BEEP parent as well as a town meeting member for Precinct 7. I also want to give um, a significant thank you to the Public Health Task Force and especially Dave Gassia for all of his hard work. They've done a remarkable job researching the safest ways possible to bring their children back to the classroom. I understand fear. I'm a pediatric emergency nurse. The first month of COVID hit, I was also afraid, but through excellent education and transparent communication at the hospital, I now walk into my job with 100% confidence. I also want you to know that I routinely see patients without symptoms with just a mask on. I don't use PPE for all my patients. I still hold my patients. I still sing to my patients. I still sit next to my colleagues less than three feet away. And I certainly am not physically distanced when I listen to a patient's heart. I always prioritize hand hygiene, I focus on symptom attestation and that has kept us safe. I want to also offer that we are, as a medical community, very willing to support our educators through this and help them feel confident that they are essential and that they can do this. I want them to embrace the innovation that COVID has forced and see things not as I can't, but how can we? Let's take lessons from the daycares and camps that remained open. Let's talk about hand hygiene. Let's talk about symptom attestation and daily positive rates. I want to echo what Jeff Neal said, fear is real, but science is too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Boaz, you're next. And then we have Acacia Landfield, Margarita Bagorni, and Gabrielle 
Veggie Vani. Sorry for the names. Um, they're coming in as a group. Hi, um, sorry, I uh, hope you can hear me. This yes, is actually, yes. uh, thanks, this is Sivan. Um, I'm Boz's wife, I'm actually gonna be speaking instead of him today. Um, so I, I, I'm just gonna sort of speak from my heart for two minutes. Um, I, I, I am not here to say that I think um, this, this, the schools should definitely be open or definitely be closed. I just have a few opinions that I do think should be noted um, and taken into a consideration. Um, I don't think we know enough right now about COVID, about how to deal with the situation, everything people have said before. Um, I think it's kind of ridiculous to expect preschoolers and kids up to second grade to be in a full classroom for hours at a time um, and expect them to wear masks and expect them to social distance. I think that that's not really an option. I mean, I have a kid going into first grade and I think that that's definitely, it, it just doesn't happen. If you look at the parks, you go to the park, you see the kids playing. I mean, it's it, they don't social distance the way people should be social distancing. Um, I think it's kind of ridiculous to expect that. Um, I, I think that our kids aren't guinea pigs. Um, it's wonderful to, look, I am all about sending kids to school the minute we can. I have two kids right now in the elementary school. Um, one of them did very well in the spring um, with distance learning. The other absolutely did not. I think it's a very difficult situation. Um, I can say that I do not feel comfortable sending my kids. And if there is the option either way, I mean, I will be having, my kids will be learning at home. Um, I'm not here to say that if other kids absolutely need to, then, you know, it's not, I don't feel like it's my decision to say that they shouldn't, um, but I don't think that it's safe uh, personally. I think there's definitely issues here to take into consideration also for kids with special needs, but kids that have IEPs. Um, so even if it were to go remotely, remote completely, I think those are certain circumstances that should be absolutely taken into consideration and not just for the kids that have somewhat severe situations where absolutely they'll have in-person services, but also other kids that just have IEPs that also need services that are, are honestly lacking if, if they are online, uh, you know, remote for, for the rest of the year or for as long as it is. Over two minutes, please conclude your remarks. Yep. Okay. Um, I just also like to mention the fact that just to thinking about, again, the possibly like an outdoor smaller cohorts um, and some kind of supervised socialization uh, um, scenario where, where kids can have some kind of socialization and feel that they are part of something, but being able to supervise in the distance and, and sort of keeping them as safe as possible. So anyway, that's my, that's my opinion. Thank you very much for all of your considerations. Thank you, Yvonne. We're going to have Acacia, Margarita, and Gabrielle uh, next, the reading uh, a third of a letter each. And then we have Julie Jett after that. Good evening, my name is Acacia and I have two rising first graders and a preschooler. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and for your exhaustive work on achieving pandemic resilient schools. The following letter was signed by over 676 Brookline parents representing roughly 1,150 children. We sent the school committee the list of signatures this morning. I will speak for two minutes followed by Dr. Margarita Bocorni, who is a physician and a parent, and Dr. Gabrielle Vajemini. Dear school committee, we write to you as concerned parents of Brookline students. Many of us are physicians, nurses, or work in public health. Others are current or former classroom teachers, educational technologists, and counselors. This letter is particularly focused on K-2, who we feel should be prioritized first and foremost, with grades three to five and six to eight following as soon as is feasible for hybrid learning and not remote plus. We all want a safe reopening in pandemic resilient schools for teachers, staff, and students alike. It is in no one's interest to open if it's not safe but this isn't a zero sum game. The effect of staying shuttered for a year or more just isn't possible by any public health or safety metric. The blueprint for, for pandemic resilient schools has been put forth by Joe Allen and his colleagues. Today at the building subcommittee meeting, the expert panel expressed that they can meet the ventilation goals for re reopening by September 16th. We must abandon the quote unquote two week postponements for reopening like what was suggested on Monday 
Instead, please set a date and the criteria by which to meet that deadline. Adapt it if necessary, but do everything in your power to meet the deadline, please. The criteria must be specified. It cannot be subjective. Otherwise, it will not happen, not now or any time this year. We strongly encourage you to prioritize facts, the science, and the needs of the children. Our kids are the ones most impacted by this decision in the long term, and they are voiceless in these decisions being made for them. Our children have already suffered through six months of mislearning and social emotional development. There is no data to suggest that even the best developed online curriculum will be even minimally effective for young learners. You cannot teach preliterate students by Zoom. This is simply a fact. It's in no way a commentary on our beloved teachers who we hold in such high esteem. Online learning is not and never will be appropriate for K-2, to nor grades 3-8. to eight. Humans need humans, not screens, and the damage that will be done to many if we overreach precautions will be severe without reasonable or evidence-based necessity. What was discussed at the school committee meeting on August 10th is not a plan. It is an abdication of responsibility. What we need is benchmarks, targets, and assessments. An early childhood learning environment cannot be replicated in a remote model. Young children will not participate. Working parents cannot be full-time teachers. Young kids will be left once again unsupervised on screens in front of YouTube and Disney Channel at best. Personal fear cannot trump scientific facts. The fact that teachers feel unsafe does not mean that they will be unsafe when returning to school buildings. We have a case positivity rate of 0.8% in Brookline and less than 2% statewide. Casinos, gyms, beaches, indoor pools, indoor restaurants, public pools are open. Preschools and summer school programs like RISE and Brookline Recreation have been in session all summer with apparently full mass compliance by young kids. Yet, the school committee is considering allowing schools to stay shut and not even prioritizing K-2 as was the plan as of last week. Your decision may have long lasting consequences for the mental health of thousands of kids and their families. Furthermore, however unintended, remote learning only contributes to the social inequalities within our Brookline community. Single parents, low income families, and women, we are gonna be the one bearing the burden of remote learning. The migration to private schools and homeschool pods outside of the public school system. People are hiring private tutors. This is real and it's happening as we speak. In the future, all current social, racial, economical disparities will be even deeper. As of last week, returning K-2 in person was a commitment and the priority. Something changed since last week. Most parents haven't even known about these school committee meetings. No outreach took place to inform parents. Parents are mostly in the dark as decisions are being made for our voiceless children. Please refer to the service of the town. Please let it guide you about how parents overwhelmingly support creative problem solving, hybrid, outdoor learning, and solutions that get kids back in person. We cannot afford to find out the cause of our own inaction. Instead, we need to act with purpose to get the solutions in the, implemented for K-2 now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so teachers have a difficult job and it's even harder now. Everyone has uh, to work differently, but we all must adapt uh, and be flexible. Oh. Learning will be drastically different for years to come. Please apply creative solutions that have worked elsewhere, like daycare centers and in-person programs like Brooklyn, Rec, and RISE. We applaud Brooklyn's universal masking policy for schools. Please continue planning for outdoor education, which is the best information at all times. Please implement outdoor education, including with tents, or even just by using shades and raincoats or on playground. K-2 kids can, uh, can and should get dirty and wet. Call a snow day if it's pouring, uh, pouring rain, but otherwise uh, let them be outside until December. Last night, Park and Rec approved the plan for Brooklyn schools to use town green spaces. What an amazing momentum to build on outdoor education. Um, Craft uh, a schedule to bring K-2 back in person full time starting September 16th. Work exhaustively to meet this deadline. In a, in a month, uh, if more time is needed, postpone for one to two weeks uh, at that time. Please don't throw in uh, the towel now. Quantified metrics. Uh, what measurable criteria will be used to define whether to return to in person learning? Commitments. What will be achieved and by when? It is feasible to evaluate each classroom this year. Parents will have. Entire schools will have already been surveyed, including by the parents' volunteers who will continue assisting if that helps school complete that important survey of ventilation to reopen. 
we implore you to follow through with the plan for K-2 returning in person. We can do it. We've been uh, planning for it, Cambridge apparently, and 80% of Massachusetts. Your remarks. Your remarks. Mm -hmm. Just, if circumstances change, we adapt. Please avoid being swayed by emotion and fear. Focus on the facts and science uh, as education should. Uh, the social and emotional well-being of thousands of children uh, falls upon you. It is our duty to get children and teachers back to school safely, respectfully. Respectfully. Uh, six, 676 Brooklyn parents. Thank you. Uh, Julie, you're up, and then Danielle Da Silva. Thank you. My name is Julie Jetty. I'm the parent of two children in the public schools of Brookline. And like many others, I would like to thank you all, um, as well as the teachers, for your hard work. Much has been said about not opening schools until they are safe. The positivity rate in Massachusetts is low, and in Brookline it is even lower, and as low as they are likely to be anytime soon. My great fear is that if teachers and students don't meet for learning early in the fall, they never will. We must take advantage of this current window of low rates because young children, middle schoolers, and high school students will be unable to engage in effective remote learning with teachers and classmates they do not know and in many cases have never met in person. Without rehashing the insufficiency of remote learning in the spring, the only reason it worked at all was that students had already formed strong relationships with students, with teachers and classmates rooted in curriculum-based learning. Government, Governor Baker emphatically pointed this out last week. Building bonds in person early in the fall is the only way full remote learning can be effective later. Please approve a plan that promises scheduled opportunities for outside in-person activities with students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Danielle, you're up, and then Catherine Wortman. Hi there. Um, thank you for giving me this time. I'm going to read a shortened edited version of a letter that I sent yesterday. Um, I just want to say, start by saying that in addition to being the parent of a kindergartner and a third grader at Baker, I am myself also an educator who works in a Brookline private school. So I do understand the concerns being put forth by teachers, many of which I share. Um, but personally, I'm disappointed that after the thoughtful hybrid plan, plan was revealed last week, it was abruptly changed. Um, many parents, I think especially those of us with younger, not yet literate children who cannot be taught effectively online, are now in the sort of existential turmoil about our situations this year. Um, so I have some concerns about how possibly the school committee and public schools of Brookline plan to partner with us to address some of these, um, including those with means are already enrolling their children in private schools or hiring personal teachers, which will take them and their advocacy outside the realm of Brookline. What are we doing to address this drain of resources and are there steps we can take to make people more confident that we can provide for all Brookline families? Um, if virtual learning exclusively is to happen and attendance and participation are required and assessed, what is the plan to address and compensate for the inevitable deepening chasm in educational access between families who can and can't provide one-on-one -on -one supervision or any supervision of their child's virtual education? Um, and then are extended day programs going to function at all? And if so, uh, would they be able to provide some in-person care for in, in school facilities during the virtual time? I do strongly believe that there is some way for Brookline to offer some in-person instruction for the youngest students sooner rather than later. And feel strongly that the onus is on our public institutions to provide some better option than having a five-year-old on a screen most of the day. As a single parent, I particularly feel the sting of the assumption that every Brookline family can either afford a full-time governess or has someone who can stay home to absorb this burden. But I'm also angry on behalf of every parent, in particular the mothers, who will need to further sacrifice their jobs, future, and economic opportunities to make this work. We need more options, and I'm still hopeful that the public schools of Brookline can support families in creatively making them happen. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um... Catherine, you are up, and then Tanya Vizikov. Can you hear me? Yes, Sorry, I just can. Yep, okay. go right ahead. Thank you so much to the school committee and everyone for letting me express my 
opinion on schools reopening in the Brookline district. As a brief background on myself and my family, I have two children in the district. One is a rising third grader and the other is a rising kindergartner. I supported the hybrid plan proposed last week and found the pivot to remote learning to be disappointing. This extreme change has given me an ultimatum. Ignore my children and continue a career that I've spent more than 15 years building or quit my job and attempt to provide my children with a subpar education. There are no other options available to me and I truly fear for those who live in a single parent household because they have less options than I have. For me, the most troubling thought is the potential for my rising kindergartner to have to spend his first year in public school as a remote learner. No matter how thought out and well planned a remote program is, it will not work for a younger student. These students will be disenfranchised by a remote system and they will suffer the most by losing access to education. In summary, I would urge the committee to take into consideration that Massachusetts has met all requirements in order to reopen schools safely and to vote in favor of a hybrid model or at the very least allow our youngest students to have access to in-person education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Tanya, you are up and then Sarah Sarko. Hi, my name is Jan Vezikov speaking on behalf of Tanya, my wife. Yes. She's from Ukraine and she is a little bashful of her beautiful accent. Is that okay? That's fine, go ahead. Okay, so my wife and I, we have four daughters, four beautiful daughters. Sophia is 11, Elizabeth is nine, and Katerina is five, and Milana is three. And Milana was, uh, she was welcome to the pre-K program. We were all excited about all four of them being in the public school system. We have lived in Brookline for four years. We love this neighborhood. We are invested in this neighborhood. I'm actually a minister of a church uh, in the neighborhood. We rent space at Temple Obey Shalom. And as a minister, so as a father, I have a perspective in that we live in 1,200 square feet. And we have been psychologically and mentally, emotionally, physically drained and, and dragged through the gutter over this season. We were told two weeks uh, to uh, flatten the curve, and then we were told another two weeks, and then it was another month, and it, was, it felt like we were running a marathon. We get to the finish line, and we're told uh, it's actually an ultra marathon, and then finally we said, you know what? The summer, we've got it. All the, all the camps were closed. And we are waiting until this day. And we cannot believe that we were told yesterday that we are reconsidering going from the hybrid model to no in-person in school. If we believe that masks work, which we do, the statistics prove it, then why can't we have in-person school with, with masks, that number one. And then as a minister, I'll tell you this, I've been ministering for the past six months to people who are on the brink of suicide. And, and I brought them back by God's grace. People who have already divorced, families in shame, shambles, people, people who have been arrested for, for child abuse because they just can't handle the stress. We have one uh, nice lady in the congregation who is a single mom. She's here from Kazakhstan. She has a child with special needs. She's here in Brookline because of the special needs uh, and proximity to Boston children. She can't afford to work a day job and care for her child. Uh, and so she is on the brink of homelessness. Our, our church has been paying for a rent for several months. Uh, there's people who, whose lives are, will truly be devastated if school is canceled. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Sarah, you are up. And then Karen Shamesh Talp. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Sarah. Go ahead. All right. I, I, I want to reiterate uh, some of the things that the previous parents said. Uh, you know, we have currently, the rates are very down. The data shows that uh, I think reopening in schools in September, October, uh, or and part of November would probably be more doable than later in the fall uh, because the flu season also starts. 
Uh, my husband is an educator and he is a COVID researcher. He has published three papers this summer. He has been interviewed by a New York Times, Boston Globe, etc. And he is still going to school. He sees the risks down uh, by wearing masks and um, keeping the, the distance. They are going to teach at MIT with a hybrid system. Not all the schools at MIT, but he, he is going to be teaching this, this semester. Um, I think at the least we should let the younger learners to go back to school. And that's also a testbed uh, for this hybrid system. Uh, the, the, the kindergartens cannot learn anything online. We experienced that uh, in the springtime and the teachers have been amazing. Um, but the, the kids, my kids couldn't stay there more than half an hour. And I know a lot of kids couldn't even attend the Zoom classes. They were drained. They, they, they couldn't stay focused. So at least for those children, let them go back to school and you can test your system. The other thing is that we can't wait for everything to be perfect. If you have a school that are already up to the standards, send the kids to those schools and then see how the system is working. And, and then you can phase in other kids as well. Uh, they have also looked at the, uh, the, the good examples. There, many schools in Europe have been open. You can find examples in Norway and Switzerland. They have used this hybrid system that you proposed last week, and it has been working. Um, so please look at the data and reconsider the plan that you proposed last week. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Karen, you're up, and then Eli Tao. Karen, go ahead. Robin, I have, does she have problems? Um, I'm not quite sure. Do you want to go to the next person and then? Yeah, we can try. It's Eli Taub. I don't know if they're related. They have the same last name. I think they are. I'm going to go to the next, the next one. No, there's. Eli, you're on mute. Can you unmute? Yes. Can, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Is, is, it the other one, is the other one a partner of yours, or? Yes, I will. I will speak on behalf of, of both of us if okay, this is great. okay. Okay. So great. my name is Eric Tauba. I'm a father of uh, three kids in the Coolidge Corner School, ages uh, uh, seven, uh, nine, and and eleven. Um, and again, I would like to, to voice uh, our concern uh, over the, this um, strange uh, shift uh, from, from the hybrid approach into a totally remote uh, modeling approach. Um, first, I'm concerned from, from the lack of transparency. I think that as was no noted earlier, uh, clearly majority of the parents are in favor of an hybrid model, if not a, a full uh, in-person model. And um, so uh, the shift in the strategy to the to a totally remote model is not very clear. And, and again, I think that transparency is a key in this entire process. Um, and lack of transparency is definitely devastating uh, for us. And again, as was very nicely said earlier, we were waiting for a very long period for the school to, to open. Uh, our kids as well. Uh, these surprising news are absolutely devastating uh, for us and for the kids. Um, I think that if we try to be uh, data-driven and fact-driven, uh, we know that Zoom doesn't work. And I know that many mentioned uh, kindergartners, first grade, second grade. I must say that as well for our older kids, yeah, uh, grades uh, three and five, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, with all of the respect to the different opinions from other stakeholders, I think that the kids are the center of this story. 
We understand now that based on the summer activities that took place, uh, that the contagious rate was uh, minimal if it doesn't exist at all. We understand that it can be done in a safe manner. And we need to remember that we cannot uh, afford ourselves without the benchmark that we know that cannot be fully met just to continue and live in this limbo um, and really sacrifice the next school, school year for this ineffective uh, remote learning methodology. As an adult that spent most of my time now in Zoom meetings, I know how difficult it is. And it's not clear to me how we can expect kids at the age of six uh, and above uh, to use the same methodology that we use an adult as the main communication tool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Aaron, you're next, and then Kristen Hung. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that's working on this. I'm a parent of a rising kindergartner and third grader. I'm also a transportation safety professional. Um, I can tell you that if we had been waiting for the equivalent of a vaccine in transportation, our entire transportation system as we know it would be shut down. Yet all of us get into a car, a bike, an airplane, we cross the street, we do so responsibly, knowing that every once in a while something may happen. I'm fully in support of the plan that was presented last week for in-person and hybrid learning, especially for our youngest learners. Uh, my five-year-old rising kindergartner couldn't even stay on Zoom for uh, summer camp, virtual summer camp, dance, song, artistic type uh, sessions, let alone learning to read and write and have her social emotional uh, needs met. Both my kids are now in a summer camp in Brookline, doing great, there've been no incidents. Uh, and this is, we're probably at a time, uh, the best time that we're going to be in for the coming year, COVID wise, as other, others have mentioned, and we should take advantage of it. We should not even wait for September 16th. The sooner we start, the better we are at great COVID benchmarks at the moment. We can use the outdoors when the weather is good, we can open windows. As far as the buildings go, we do not need all the classrooms to be in compliance. We just need enough to begin with as many of the younger grades as is possible to begin with. And then we can phase in later. We can have concurrent upgrading, installation of filters, and everything else for the, for the older kids. But if we don't take advantage of the good weather, the good COVID conditions that we have now, and await for the equivalent of perfection of a vaccine, uh, essentially, is what um, we're reading between the lines here as the parents that signed the letter, then we will lose the year, possibly more, and all of the mental and physical health crises that have been talked about by some of the speakers before me, which are already real, they will multiply and magnify, and we're going to have a crisis as a town and a community at a time when we're green on the map issued by the state, surrounded by green and white communities from which our teachers commute, and we have no excuse for going about our daily lives as adults, going to the grocery store, going to the beach, going on jogs, uh, getting out there to parks and to our socially distant, distanced activities while expecting our kids to bear the burden of this pandemic on their back, staying at home, not seeing their friends, not seeing other kids. If we begin the year with in-person, we may be able to end it in person. But if we do not, at least we will have the children meet their peers, meet their teachers, and form relationships and, and learn their personalities so the teachers can then be effective online if the need to do so and go to remote learning arises. But we have no excuse at the moment to oh, not at it. least begin mm -hmm. with the rooms that are compliant and with what we know from science. Thank you. Just one, uh, we know from science that masks work and we have multiple layers of protection that can be implemented and the transparency then the lack of transparency in going to this remote all remote plan um is astounding thank you very much thank you Aaron. uh so kristen you're up and then we have deepa 
Rusty. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, boy. Hi, boy. Oh, sorry. I have a lot of background noise. Hello? Can you guys yeah. hear me? Not well. You have a lot of background noise. Oh, Is there sorry. Um, hi, sorry. I'm having some technical problems. Um, I'm Kristen. I just wanted to support. I'm a Rough and Ridley parent and physician. Um, and I want to support the universal masking decision. I thank you guys for doing that. And I also want to advocate for face shields or protective eyewear, if at all possible, for the teachers. Um, and right now, I support the Remote Plus model with phasing in as health benchmarks allow because it allows the flexibility and micro adjustments as the medical data emerges. Um, but I think it should allow for the logistics and the infrastructure to be optimized on a cyclic model, which is the most sound from a quality improvement perspective, uh, because the sacrifice that our children would be making by being fully remote to start the year should enable us to develop safe, sustainable ways to bring them back in person as quickly as possible this year and minimize the chances that we need to reverse and shut down again. Um, I think a unidirectional phasing in is the best for everyone's emotional health and logistics as well. Um, we all wanna follow the data and the information we have so far is reassuring. I agree with the other um, scientists and physicians who have spoken. Um, and it's what allows us to even be having this reopening debate, but we still don't know enough about viral transmission in, in children. Um, most recent studies are indicating that school closures may have prevented about a million cases of COVID that was published in JAMA two days ago. Um, and young children with mild to moderate symptoms have a high viral load higher than older children and adults, suggesting that they might actually be more contagious than we realize. Um, so I just, I think, you know, everyone is working really hard and we should be afforded some, some grace and exercise some patience in terms of developing a model, but I don't see it as a debate between whether we should be in person or remote. I think we have to start remotely, but we have to be working towards concrete um, reopening and phasing in as quickly as possible. The hospitals did this pretty quickly, actually, and because we started conservatively, we were able to actually ramp up quicker than we expected. Um, and so I envision a similar model. I don't picture us being remote all year or even for most of the year. Uh, but thank you all for your work. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Deepa, you are up. And then Maggie Caniff. Am I on? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I just wanted to, I want to thank uh, the committee and thank all the speakers. Um, um, I just wanted to uh, voice my, our opinion. Um, we have a rising first grader and um, um, I'm also a clinician and, uh, and I have uh, several patients who are who are teachers, so I hear all the concerns. Um, I think it, one thing that we have noticed in our family is is you know remote learning for for the young children is just is not working very well. Our son was doing fine when he was able to see his his classmates for forty five minutes um, four days a week, um, but since school ended has become increasingly anxious and it's concerning as parents, it's concerning. I'm lucky in that my, my husband has been able to be home and help with some of the, try, trying to make sure that he's on target. Um, I also hear the concerns um, that the teachers have. And I think, um, and I think, you know, we need to, sort of see all sides, not all, it, it's, I think this has already been voiced that um, not all families are able to have somebody at home while their children are learning at home. We, we all have jobs that we have to get to as well. Um, and here are the challenges. Some of the t concerns teachers have had is not having appropriate PPE. Again, as a healthcare worker, that has also been 
um, my concern. And I think if we create a safe environment, uh, my hope was to start early when we could do classes, small classes outside. Um, um, but everyone is, is concerned about safety. And I think providing the appropriate PPE for, for teachers and staff in school will hopefully help some of these situations. Um, and the anxiety that everyone has had. Um, mm -hmm. One of the, I just want to say that one one thing that I have tried to reassure my patients who are teachers is that they have not they have not been in the situation working yet, and once they do it, they will realize that it isn't it is not as anxiety provoking as as they might think. I mean, I think there is a way to go about this safely. Thank you. Thank you, Diva. Uh, Maggie, you are up, and then Steve Watson. Hi, my name is Maggie and I teach kindergarten at the Lincoln School and my son's a rising first grader at the Heath School. As a kindergarten teacher, I am often vulnerable in front of my students. I forget the words to a song or sing off key or I draw a really bad representation of scissors or something on the board. And every time, every year, my kindergartners respond with amazing compassion. I think that this is because young children are at a time and space in life where almost everything that they do is new, scary, and challenging. No matter who you are, if you are listening to this, you are about to do something new, scary, and challenging. And I want to tell you, it's okay if you don't draw a perfect picture, if you sing off key, if you're not a tech whiz, if you are scared, if you are angry or sad. I would also like to ask you to tell me that it's okay to feel the way I feel and to be scared and to do my best and keep going. Every one of us is doing our best as parents, as teachers, as administrators, and as humans. Members of the school committee, Dr. Marini and school administrators, we know you've been up nights agonizing over this decision, trying to find solutions to impossible problems. We know you have your own families. You've been neglecting because the weight of these decisions and these plans is so incredible. We are all being asked to figure out a puzzle with all the wrong pieces that don't fit together. And when the pieces are all somehow put into place, no matter what model we have, it's not going to look anything like the picture of school we are used to or the one we envisioned for our children. But maybe if we look at it with compassion and we all encourage each other, maybe all the broken and misshapen pieces can still make something beautiful. I believe we can make something beautiful, but only if we are allowed to be vulnerable and only if we are willing to be compassionate. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Maggie. Steve, uh, you are up. And then our last speaker is Cami Brothers after Steve. Thanks, Maggie. That was really sweet. I had things to say about love and kindness and courage, but I, I cut them for sake of time. So I'm going to come up relationships from a different angle here. My name is Steve Watson. Over the past 15 years, my wife Grace and I have raised three children in the Brookline Public Schools. Uh, two are still enrolled in high school here. I was also a public school educator, both as a teacher and a high school principal in nearby districts. I later served for four years in the Driscoll School Site Council for two years as co-chair. I want to say that in the current debate, we have no ideal choices, but I do just want to underscore that while the risks with in-person education are real and obvious, those with so-called distance learning are really great as well. Uh, while online, we exacerbate Brookline's significant achievement and engagement gaps around class, race, and learning differences. Uh, not just our youngest children, as we've heard a lot tonight, or our poorest children, who we've heard a little, but most of our youth of all ages struggle with learning independence consistently robust internet access and parental supervision. They also starve for relationship and belonging, our teens too. Uh, if for any periods of the coming year school is run online, I'd like us to be much more cognizant and committed to addressing these risks. 
Regardless of our choices, I'd urge all our school leaders and staff and parents to place greater thinking and emphasis on strong relationships. Strong relationships undergird most good learning, including in the upper grades. Students who don't experience belonging have less motivation and engagement in their learning. Uh, throughout the spring and in some of the communications regarding the year to come, we've heard a lot about how to teach content well in various modes. Schools have practiced broadcast communication, sharing videos prepared by staff or lessons online, but students belong not so much when they're talked at as when they are listened to. A relationship and trust comes from being known as much as knowing. Our high school leaders have acknowledged this to some degree in their stated commitment recently to community and collaboration as a core principle, but I'd like to hear far more of that from our high school and from all the schools. How will we listen to our youth this year, not just talk to them, regardless of format, and amidst the substantial isolation, loss, and confusion they are all facing? How will we help them not just know things, but really be known and belong? Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Cami, you are up, and another speaker, uh, Lauren Bernard, will be our last speaker. She just showed up. So Cami, you're next, and then Lauren. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Cammie. Go ahead. Thank you. I just want to make one main point, which is that I urge the committee to make this decision based on local data, not on fear, which is based on other states' information, not our own. Brookline and all of Massachusetts had worked incredibly hard to, to flatten the curve, and we have now been flat since June. We are at an incredibly low infection rate at 0.85%. We can't expect lower. And the gov I urge the committee to follow the governor's recommendations issued today that low-risk communities such as our own go fully online or, if, or sorry, go fully in person, and if not possible, follow the hybrid model recommended last week. Now I'd like to give the last uh, word to my daughter, Liella, who on her own prompting uh, prepared a statement, which she will read. If she's too soft, set, tell, um, please tell me, and if her voice is too soft, and I'll read it for her. Um, hello, I'm in fifth grade going to Pierce. I think kids should go back to school because um, I'm in the learning center, and I don't think I can get the help that I need um, online school. Um, my sister is going to the second grade and she is not focusing online. She is not um, she is not learning as much as she would um, in person. And my brother um just looks at my brother just looks at his phone um my at online school followed with many other more kids I think do. Um I do think schools do have a space and that they could make it work to have all kids go back to school. But however, I think the teachers and principals are scared and have fear. Who wouldn't? Because um, anyone could get sick. As my point of view, I don't want my parents to get sick, and I don't want anyone to get sick. Um, but I think that we can make it safe and also have all kids go back to school. Um, and some kids can afford to go to private school, which is doing um, um, the not online school in person. In person. Um, but some families cannot afford to um, to go to private school. So if one family can, that doesn't solve the problem. My dad always says that you have to be a problem solver. And that's what I think we all have to do. We all have to be problem solvers to solve this problem, to get um, our kids back to school safely. Thank you, that's all from, from us. Thank you very much.
Uh, Lauren, you are our last speaker. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, go ahead. Well, it's very, that's a very tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, first, I, I wanna thank um, Dr. Marini, the school committee, all the teachers and parents who have spent a lot of time. Um, I want to state from the beginning that I believe that a hybrid system is best because I just feel there will never be an environment that meets some crazy bar that I just saw in the chat of not a single infection in Massachusetts for two weeks. I mean, we're never going to see that until there's a widespread vaccine. So I think we have to think about schools as being uh, COVID resistant, I believe is what one of the uh, scientists said prior to maybe half an hour ago. Um, and, you know, in the end, you guys all got a gift today. You got state guidance that came out. And I would think this makes your decision a lot easier. Basically, there, the metrics that we see, the state, you know, numbers we see, and now this, the governor and the, and the commissioner are saying there's no reason to be fully remote when you're in a green or yellow zone. And in fact, you shouldn't be. So I think that makes your job a lot easier. I'm glad something's made your job a lot easier. Um, and I'd also like to say that perhaps the, this sort of state guidance can end the divisiveness uh, that, that, has, that has happened and that is so unfortunate. And, you know, there really was a lack of leadership at the state and federal level. And now there is some leadership at the state level. So, you know, late, I suppose late, you know, better, better late than never, but still. And lastly, what I'd like to say is I served on one of the expert advisory panels, panel two, which was about, we called it the whole child. And what we studied was social emotional wellness and both a, basically a hybrid in-person model and a remote model. And over and over again, we were asked to, to you know, try to focus on the remote. And we kept sliding back to in-person with subjects like wearing masks and risk mitigation and what do we do about no more hugging and all of this, because it's the only scenario where effective socio and emotional interventions can actually happen. We couldn't think of any or very few ways to mitigate the socio and emotional harm that we, we know has happened, happened in my family. Um, how to mitigate that? We couldn't come up with anything really really effective that we thought would be effective. And there were people far more expert on that panel than myself, uh, brain scientists, uh, psychologists, et cetera. So I, I guess what that says is, you know, there really is no way to mitigate the socio and emotional harm that being out of school, not to, not to mention domestic abuse, um, food insecurity, and all the other things, job insecurity that come with it. So if the state thinks we can do it, and our building department thinks we can do it, I think we have to all believe we can do it, and I urge you to vote for a hybrid model. Thank you. Oh, and my name again is Lauren Bernard, <laughs> town meeting member, precinct eight, and on panel two. Sorry for that. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, uh, that is, we did that very well. So thank you everyone. Thank you to all our speakers. Uh, you really did try to stick to the two minutes. So we appreciate it. it gives us more time to uh, deliberate and talk and get ready for our vote. Uh, if our members need to take a two minute break, you help yourself, but we're not going to take a formal one until we get a little further along because we've got a, probably a pretty long night. So uh, we are now going to move into the discussion, and then it'll lead to the vote eventually. Uh, and so, Jim, are, so am I turning this over to you? And you're going to get us up to date? Yes, thank you. Wow, those comments were terrific. Really heartfelt uh, and, and very, very much appreciated. And I think uh, one takeaway is uh, when you think you're communicating, you should go back and double and triple the communication, particularly when there's uh, a, a lot of anxiety involved. So thank you, everybody, for that. That's, uh, uh, that, that's heard. Uh, I, I do want to say that I think, uh, well, I let, here we go. I think people know, but maybe they don't. But I do want to say that uh, the hybrid model was our pervert, preferred model. And uh, even the state guidance, it says in there, uh, unless there are extenuating circumstances, and it specifically mentions ventilation. 
So the ventilation piece is the piece that sent us off track. Going, uh, going full steam on a uh, hybrid model, uh, the, the logistics of it are, are pretty daunting, but we were going full steam ahead on a hybrid model for the reasons that most of the speakers spoke to, you know, getting students in. Plus we prioritize the younger students, uh, the, the pre-K, and grades one, two. We tried to get as much as three, but we couldn't get three in because of the distancing and the space. But we looked at one uh, uh, pre-K, K one and two to go in with the hybrid model. And we were going there until the, uh, the ventilation uh, piece interrupted us. And uh, now Matt, who's on the call here, has been, and I'm gonna ask you to speak in a minute, Matt. Uh, Matt, who's been is on the call, he has been working and as one of the speakers noted with uh, uh, community volunteers going through the buildings. In fact, we went and I went and, and sat in one of the rooms, a couple of the rooms to look at the distancing, social distancing, and uh, and, and looking at the uh, the air exchange rate. And, uh, and the, the buildings, a number of the buildings did not measure up to the uh, air exchange rate as determined by the health panel. And so Matt has been working uh, very hard to uh, bring the air quality in the different rooms up to standard. And he's actually been extremely successful in the sense that we know now uh, that the kindergarten kids, we can bring them in. All of those rooms are now up to standard so the kindergarten kids can come in. And, uh, and Matt did that by uh, targeting the rooms for kindergarten and using the materials that he was receiving and, and using them in those rooms so the air exchange rate met that standard. And our goal would be to look at grade one next and those rooms and in terms of having them to be at the standard, we'll move grade, we'll uh, move grade into. And pre beep and, and kindergarten, uh, full-time, not hybrid, not half-time, but full-time with appropriate distancing and using the, as the, uh, the staff, additional staff that we have in order to, um, if we have to split classes, we have to have uh, teachers to deal with that. And we're gonna use the additional staff uh, for that purpose. And now we have to look at grade one, then grade two, to see where that is at and uh, and the rest. So Matt, can you give us a, a quick little update before it comes back to me? Actually, Jim, it's Casey. I was able to make it back in time to jump in if you want me to start. Um, I don't know. Up to okay. you. Hey, hey, welcome back. Welcome, Casey. It's good to see you. Well, not see you. Good to hear you. Um, but uh, I, was, I was just talking about the big interrupter we had was ventilation. Yeah. And and uh, if you saw even the report that we saw that came out from the panel, that we shouldn't be putting students in, uh, we shouldn't put students or staff in, in a room where the ventilation isn't at the standard. We should not be doing that. And, uh, and we're not going to do that. So, uh, but our goal is to return students to, to class in-person in class with their teachers as quickly as possible once we mitigate the risk. Uh, and if, when the risk is mitigated, then we should be moving to move students in classes, which really takes us right to the original uh, hybrid model when the buildings can, um, when, when, the, when the ventilation can actually sustain that in, the, uh, in each building. So Casey, hang on for a minute. We're gonna probably do this a little bit differently than just giving a, a straight report, but you may wanna to speak to in a minute, Casey, coming back to, uh, we prioritize the, the preschool, now kindergarten is in, and we have the um, most vulnerable kids and what that, what that may mean. And we can speak a little bit to uh, enrollment or where it is now, but we should probably keep focused on uh, the major issue here in terms of how much can we open right now what are we looking for in terms of when can we get to continuing to open and what does that look like? So I would ask Matt, can you give us an update on the facilities, Matt, because that's the piece that uh, I think we need to have uh, with, with, with the benchmarks, with metrics, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so I have been uh, working with folks from the expert advisory panel four, as well as Charlie Simmons um, at 
at uh, the town facilities department and uh, uh, the town procurement office. And, um, you know, looking at our, our air change rate and trying to meet the target of five air change rates per hour, which is recommended by by uh, uh, Joe Allen and, and I think will be voted on Friday by the um, uh, expert advisory panel full of uh, medical doctors and PhDs in, 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 in the field of industrial hygiene and, and disease control. Um, you know, we, we, we know we have a pretty good idea of what we have going on in the, in the schools now of, of air change rates, but we want to actually test it and measure it um, and then modify that where we can to uh, increase it to uh, an air change rate of up to five or, or, uh, or, or four with um, uh, HEPA filters or um, uh, uh, MERV 13 filters. And the reason we can do kindergarten is, is today we did get a delivery of 100 um, HEPA, poor or HEPA units uh, that were initially thought of to, to cover all the interior rooms, but um, we can, we can um, do that we can move those to cover all the kindergarten rooms and be ready for september 16th we are working to order uh, more units we're trying to be somewhat uniform so we don't have um, umpteen different brands and models uh, in the system it's just not easy to uh to get the number you're looking for in short order when um you know many school systems are trying to do the exact same thing as well as folks in the in the uh private sector and, and office uh, spaces uh, to, to improve the air quality. And the, the, the targets, you know, set, um, you know, I, I believe are attainable. It's just going to take us a little bit of time. And I don't want to, uh, you know, say something that we can't deliver. But um, as far as, you know, things on hand, we have all the PPE that's been recommended um, uh, by DESE, and it's all on hand and all ready to go. And we're, we're you know, calculated for the first 62 days of the year and we'll reassess after a month. So the, the staff uh, don't have to worry about that aspect. And if we're going to have, uh, you know, people in school, uh, we'll be social distancing and the, the air quality will be enhanced, enhanced probably above just about anywhere else in the, in the public that, that our students are going to go. Um, I think the the panel has is, is set a high standard, but an, uh, an achievable one. And uh we're, we're working to get there and I'll be uh, in on Saturday morning uh, along with some town staff and some some folks from Harvard and an engineering team that sort of specialize in this to make to train us and share information so we can verify we're doing everything uh, the right way uh, in case we cannot hire enough uh, outside um, engineers and consulting firms to, to, to get all our schools ready. So we're going to be able to, to get there and we're going to be able to get there for each and every space uh, that we're going to have uh, students and staff in. Okay, so um, we are going to get there in each and every space, uh, but it's going to be a matter of, uh, you know, when is that space going to become, become available becomes the question. And, and that's the question that you alluded to, that you don't want to make a promise you can't deliver on. And then what do we do when we say a certain date and we're not ready for that? Do you have any sense of when you will be able to nail down a date uh, that says, so that we can, we, we should be rolling grades in. We should be, I think anyway, looking at uh, the younger kids, grade one, then grade two, and, and moving ourselves through the system. I agree. I think that's that's a, a practical and manageable uh, approach to to meet and maintain a high standard while we're trying to um, gather you know significant amount of information and, and and implement a significant amount of of equipment changes to to to, to meet those standards. Um, and I'm hoping that I I can provide uh, good updates every few days to every week. Um, I was, I was hoping for some more good news tonight. I mean, I, I got some yesterday and then some more this afternoon. Um, I just, I don't want to jinx anything and, and I don't want to advertise too much who we're working with or what we're doing because we don't need any more competition. <laughs> okay, but before uh, we go maybe to Casey, uh, Suzanne, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm feeling this, the sensitivity of people who uh, on the comments saying, uh, once you start in one mode, you're, you're going to stay there and you're never going to change. And I, 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 I don't want that to happen. 
So um, I'm, I would be asking that we would put on the school committee agenda uh, every time we meet uh, the uh, an update of where we are in terms of our progress towards in, in just an update on not how we're we doing, but as we're moving toward the goal is to return students to uh, in, in person learning as quickly as we can. And uh, we, it would be great if we had a standing agenda item where yeah. we report out on that every, every single time we, we report out. And we will we'll kick up the communication piece. It may get a little redundant, but that's okay. We'll kick up the communication piece around that as we go as well. And what I'm trying to say is we are not, uh, the, the remote plan was not in our, uh, was not in our, in, in our original plan because we felt uh, a, a hybrid re with spacing and appropriate um, safety PPE masks uh, and training, we would be able to manage that. You know, it's going to in include increasing staff and all that, but we could manage that in smaller groups. So uh, we would like to adhere to that with the caveat that if, if, the, if the building doesn't meet that standard, then I cannot recommend that students and staff go into the room that doesn't meet that standard. I, ju I just can't recommend that. Right, right, so, so, so I think I'm hearing that we're also looking at a kind of classroom by classroom, not uh, the whole school necessarily. So I think we're trying to meet the needs of the classrooms, right? And and as you said, we'll put it on the agenda. It's just a standing agenda item yep. every meeting. Uh, Helen, I know, is also talking about having frequent meetings in capital subcommittee. Helen, did you want to jump in? I know yes, that you're yes, exactly. I just wanted to add to what you were saying, Dr. Marini. Um, the capital subcommittee will be meeting uh, probably uh, every two weeks and sometimes weekly. We have been already. We will continue. Our next meeting is in two weeks uh, to discuss progress in terms of ventilation. Uh, we felt we needed to give Charlie and Matt some time to get things moving, yeah. get information so that they have something to report back. Um, and we plan to continue to meet uh, I mean, until September 16th and beyond, just until we get get everybody back in the buildings. Yeah. Yeah. And Jim, would you or Casey like to just talk a little bit about the uh, plus side of this plan? Uh, no. Casey, can you do that? Or do you want me to go into that? No, I can go into it unless you're dying to. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm dying, but I'm no that, that's fine, Casey. You talked about the, the plus side of it. Uh, thank you, uh, Suzanne. That's an important piece of it. Yeah, no problem. And um, much of this uh, may be repeated, um, uh, but I'm happy to um, add this information in case that it is not. Um, I think the committee has heard from Jim already that um, we are able to uh, expand uh, the number of students coming back in full in person to include kindergarten um, and then uh, on a rolling basis add classrooms as they become available. I do want to make a note about the um, most vulnerable student group. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to speak to this um, the other night, but um, there was a slide that showed uh, um, a list of students who would be considered um, students with complex and significant needs. And I want to clarify because I think that there was some confusion out there um, that it meant um, uh, all students on IEPs and all students with the English learner designation, um, which is not accurate. Um, so the list includes students with IEPs who on their IEPs, um, in a student's IEP, in every student's IEP, there's a page called the PL3, which lists the primary disability and the level of need, which is determined by the service grid. So it's the number of minutes that a student gets in his or her IEP. The more minutes, the higher the need. And so for parents who are wondering if their students fall into the high needs category, um, they can certainly request a copy of their IEP or their PL3 um, or look in uh, their own students' IEPs to see if they have that designation. I have had some requests to change that designation, and unfortunately, um, that subverts the IEP process. I cannot change IEPs. Uh, just want to make that clear. The next group of students considered would be students from low-income households. Following that, 
um, or students who are homeless in foster or congregate care. Then we also have students who primarily use aided and augmentative communication. Um, and then students who are identified as English learners and have complex and significant needs. We have begun to identify English learners um, who have this high level of need as students who are of ELD level two, or I believe it's below two. So these are students who do not have a lot of proficiency um, in English, um, whose parents do not either. And what we're finding when we are um, filtering for this information, we're seeing that there's a lot of overlap um, uh, among these uh, bullets that I just mentioned. And so that number 300, uh, that was cited earlier this week um, is about that number when we filter for all of these groups. Okay, so, so a part of the plus is is uh, the outdoor space. Right, that's yep. what I was just getting there. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. go ahead, Jim. No, no that's I, fine. I was just going to say that uh, uh, the uh, the I'm, I'm going to read it because otherwise I won't get it right. But the uh, the school leaders uh, have. They've already communicated with each other. And they're going to be working with their staffs to create a schedule and predictable outdoor in-person meetups at school buildings throughout the fall uh, to the extent possible while the weather is nice. These meetups will primarily involve community and relationship building uh, and, and uh, that will help build connections with students and peers. They'll meet their teachers and there'll be a focus on social and emotional wellness. Uh, and while planning these meetups, school teams will pay special attention to health and safety requirements, as well as the inclusion of student populations who are either either cannot physically get to the building or are reluctant to participate uh, due to health or safety concerns. Uh, for this reason, schools will also continue to implement ways in which community engagement can be built uh, online. So uh, the principals essentially are going to be working with their staffs to use that outside space in a predictable and scheduled way. And they need, they will do that, um, well, essentially get to it uh, as soon as they have their teachers and, and pull all of that together. And, and with that said, I just want to add that somebody mentioned in the comments uh, the need for a health and wellness coordinator. Uh, that point is well taken. And, uh, and that's something I need to dig into, but that I just, I just want to just make that point that that is well taken. Um, let's see. Uh, for, for students beginning the school year in person, outdoor breaks will be scheduled throughout the day as deemed appropriate by school leaders as well. So those kids are going to be going outside as well. So we, uh, the plan is to use the outdoor space, whether it's under a tent or not, there's plenty of space that won't be under a tent in order to engage kids in, uh, in their learning outside uh, as, as much as possible. And that makes sense uh, to, to what people are trying to accomplish. Scheduled and it'll be part of the, part of the program. What else, Casey, on the, on the plus? Uh, so the re remote learning uh, remote learning academy one change I don't know if you had talked about it yet but one change from the last um, presentation was that um, we would have that begin on the first day of school uh, which is presently scheduled for September 16th. Okay. Okay. Uh... And those are my updates. Unless you want me to speak to anything else. Well, well, a little bit about the enrollment. Uh, do we have uh, an update on the enrollment? Um, Let's do. Let me see if Aaron is on yet. Doesn't seem yeah, we, like it. We, we have a little bit of an update on the enrollment. There are 44 uh, new kindergartners that were enrolled in the Office of Registration and Enrollment between July and September of 2019. We do have a, a lower, a lower than that uh, we have right now, but we're anticipating more families to come in. But our enrollment in, uh, coming in is a little lower than it, than it was last year, but it's not like dramatically lower. So we don't see that that's a, a huge drop off at this point, uh, but we're monitoring that. Um, Erin is also logging in. She just uh, finished another uh, engagement, so she should be able to speak a little bit more if anybody has questions. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think the biggest thing was the, uh, from my perspective, the biggest thing that, that we're dealing with here is the ventilation and with the metrics. We hit the yeah. metrics, we're good to go. We, that more or less certifies that space consistent with our expert panels. And, uh, and then uh, we are, we are definitely, uh, we are definitely good to go. The, uh, the, the metric, and I'll, I'll say this while we're waiting for Aaron too, that, um, Dr. Pollock, Nero Pollock, you, uh, I, I was invited, uh, Susan Ditkoff, you're right about that. I was invited to a meeting last night that was a multi-community meeting that was looking at forming a consortium for uh, finding a way of providing low cost testing. And it, that consortium is made up of a number of communities, Wellesley, Brookline, and then uh, some other communities that are more urban, Revere, Somerville, um, Chelsea, and uh, there's a group that's working on that. And I call Mel Kleckner. He uh, wants to meet with Nera and with me uh, so that we can participate fully in that uh, in process. They're going to be doing fundraising and trying to uh, determine a way that they could actually see if we can get testing for symptomatic, asymptomatic uh, students, staff, uh, and, and to make that happen, it's in the very early budding. It's, it's a concept right now, but uh, it, it is probably going to be um, the, the person who was who was sort of the titular head of it is uh, a physician out of Wellesley, and he may be uh, he may be making public comments. But we are just in the initial stages of being part of it, but nothing concrete has uh, has happened. But you'll hear more about that. Actually, if I could add to that, when uh, I think Suzanne was also on the call with the Commissioner of Education um, yes. yesterday or the day before. Right now, the Zoom calls are sort of mixing in one to I, the other. I know. I know. Um, but he very clearly said that the state was going to be coming up with a testing plan. So yeah. you know, we're working on it. The state's working on it. You know, and hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll get that together so that, you know, that's another piece of the puzzle to put together to allow us to go back uh, and mitigate the risk as much as possible. Yeah, well said. I think that's a, that's a large part of the puzzle, that it, it's a, but it's a piece. It's not the whole thing, but it's a pretty significant piece of the puzzle. Testing and tracing, contact tracing. Aaron, Aaron did you want to jump in before? Do I know where we're I don't know if she has anything else to add. Um, yeah, I can speak a little bit more to um, the enrollment. So our kindergarten and our preliminary numbers right now um, are around the 485 range, which is a little bit lower um, than our previous school years. But again, our Office of Registration and Enrollment does anticipate um, an increase in, in that enrollment. Um, or in those registrations for kindergarten, obviously after we vote and our plan is finalized. Um, and there's always a lot of um, meetings and um, registrations that happen between August and even after the school year begins um, for students in our kindergarten class, especially. Um, and then Megan Ganey, who is our director or our coordinator of registration and enrollment did speak a little bit about some travel. Um, restrictions potentially delaying some starts for um, some folks if they have to you know quarantine for 14 days before they come in can they actually come into the office or um, to provide the paperwork in order to enroll so there are some i think delays that will happen but overall our enrollment is only 230 students lower than last year right now and it's very dispersed across all grade levels our high school is pretty much um, the same as last year. And so we're not seeing, at least right now, a, a big decrease that would um, allow us, in my opinion, to bring all students back in every single grade level once classrooms are ready um, and, and meet that six foot requirement. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. So this is, this is what I think we're going to do. Um, Jim, if you uh, maybe could just kind of summarize the plan that we are voting on. I'll try and help you if you forget things. And then 
If we have that moved as a motion and seconded, then we will open it up to discussion. We'll let everybody speak at least once uh, as we go through, and then if we have time, we'll speak again. Uh, and then and then we will lead up to a vote after a considerable amount of time and discussion. So if you do you want can you do that? I can I can I can do that, Suzanne. And and then if uh, if I do forget something, you will trigger me. But I first want to say this is not the plan for the year. This is the opening plan. This is the plan to open school. Our goal is to return as many kids to uh, in-person instruction as we can and and putting it on the agenda as a regular standing item on the agenda is is a way to keep it front and center that uh, it doesn't just become routine it's a front and center issue that's our goal that's what we strive for that's what we want to do the issue that got in the way i'm going to say it again was ventilation i know there's been a lot of talk of fear and all of that uh and and you know everybody has fear of one level or another and and, and that's fine but what drove the decision was the ventilation. And there was nothing else that drove it. I'm, it's as simple as that. If, if, if the ventilation isn't uh, at the standard, then, and we've had this discussion, I know we had it, we've had it in public, but I just wanna reiterate it, that if the, if the ventilation isn't to the standard that has been um, provided by the expert panel and verified through the, um, expert institutions and research then you know it's, to me it's irresponsible to put kids in a building in that way so that so that, that's sort of the the background to what i'm about to say that it's an opening plan it is not the plan for the year and we're calling it uh, um, remote plus because it's not just remote it's the plus piece that makes a difference essentially uh the plan would say right now we're prioritizing the, the uh, youngest students and the uh, most vulnerable. The pre-K, BEEP, they'll schedule, they go full-time. Kindergarten, they're scheduled, they will go full-time. Um, vulnerable populations, meaning English language learners, high needs, special education, uh, and uh, low-income uh, students, and they will be prioritize and they will go to school full time. And then the, the others will, will begin the year in remote simultaneously. Um, Matt is going to be working on ventilation and we will again prioritize from the younger grades. And when we are at a place where we get the green light to go on grade one, we will uh, bring grade one in. We'll have to figure out the staffing as we go, but we'll bring grade one in, and then we'll go to grade two. Uh, so the, the, the plan is prioritize the young ones, prioritize the vulnerable ones. They're in full time. Uh, continue working on moving up the grades. And, and then when we get past grade two and the facility becomes more available, we'll look at implementing the hybrid. We'll look at moving in, into the hybrid model. That's the plan. It's to open school. And there has to be some reliability that we can open school. That means there has to be uh, areas that we know that we have control over. We can open school. That's very important. It can't be on a hope or a promise. We can open school. And, that, uh, and then so we would do it that way. The plus part of it is bringing in different grades uh, at different times whether it's orientation, connecting with your teacher, doing some uh, outdoor activities that are, are, are curriculum-based, um, scheduled, part of the student's uh, program, uh, and we'll be uh, we will part of the student's schedule. We'll deal with uh, transportation and those students who may or may not feel comfortable coming in, we will deal with that. But the plus is to try to engage kids in on the school grounds at least, with their teachers, knowing their teachers, and getting to spend a little bit of time with their friends. Always in the background, because we're gonna be coming back to the school community meeting repeatedly. Where are we on the, on the milestones? Where are we on the milestones? What grades are coming in? Are we ready to go with another grade? Are we ready to go with the, uh, uh, with the hybrid? Maybe we go to the hybrid with, uh, who knows, three, four, and then go four, five, uh, five, six rather. 
So we'll be rolling it out as, as, the, as the conditions on the ground allow us to do that. That's the plan. That's uh, the uh, thinking behind it. And did I leave anything out, Suzanne? Well, I think uh, just the remote learning academy, that families will have that option. Yeah, re remote learning academy. Uh, parents will be asked to, uh, uh, we're going to send something out next week and ask parents to declare if they want to be remote. Uh, and, and the reason we want to start it early is so they'll have uh, a consistent teacher right from the very beginning. And they'd be able to stay with uh, with that with those teachers. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a putting a puzzle together with with the students and the teachers that has to mesh. But that's our goal: is to have uh, the students who elect to be remote and teachers who elect to be remote and match that, so that academy will stay together. There'll be some reliability to it. At the same time, there's going to have to be another point and uh, another point where somebody else may decide you know somebody may decide i'm remote but i want i want to go in and so that we should be able to accommodate that somebody is in and may say i want to go remote we should be able to accommodate that we just cannot accommodate it day to day it would have to be a decision we talked about for a term probably before a mocking period before they make a decision to go one way or the other Thank you. Do I have someone who would move that as a motion, the plan, as we heard it? Helen, thank you. Do I have a second? Jennifer, thank you. Uh, so, so that's on the table. That's our motion. We would take at least an hour, I'm sure, to discuss it and to uh, ask our questions, figure out what it is we need to know to, in order to make a uh, knowledgeable vote a well-informed vote and then uh and then we will we will take the vote so who would like to go first i'm going to give you each a chance of course helen go right ahead yeah i'll go first because i want to explain why i'm supporting this uh, uh, vote that we're taking i think it's based on um a lot of what we got in the letter from um dr marini today that will um uh be probably going out, I think, to parents too at some point, correct? Yep, we um, will send that out to parents tomorrow. I believe we already might have posted it on the website as well. So that will make it much clearer. But I think that this is the way to go. My, uh, the way I see this is we are doing what we can, but we know we can do today. We are approving that. And I think that's important to get people started and working on things. I also heard the, the commissioner say that, you know, staff, teachers need to pre be prepared for all three models. And giving, having a plan in place allows us to then say, okay, staff, teachers, we need you to plan for X, Y, and Z. I mean, fortunately, kindergarten teachers can plan for in-person uh, stuff and beep teachers, but the rest of the staff need to plan for all three. And I guess even the kindergarten and beep need to plan for the possibility of remote if that, you know, unfortunately would happen. Um, I feel like it's the, it's the logical way to proceed forward. I can assure people that from the Capital Subcommittee and as chair of the Capital Subcommittee, I will be pushing I mean, I don't have to push Matt. He's he's moving at his own pace, but but making sure that we are on top of this, that we are moving forward, and that we're getting as many classrooms as possible open as soon as possible, um, whether that's you know a week after the the uh, September sixteenth, a couple of days. I mean, it, it sort of all of it is a, a work in progress, and as we know more, we will let people know more. So I'm, I'm very pleased to start to at least have a plan that our staff can now move forward with. Yeah, Barbara. Um, I, I am very pleased with this plan. It makes a great deal of sense to me. And um, I think that on the one hand, it may make some people nervous. My child's not getting what everybody else is getting, or you know, I want my child in, but there's no space for them. And I think there was someone named Maggie who spoke, who talked about scared, but keep going. So, you know, it, you have to make an assumption that in the long run, it will work. 
And you might be scared in certain ways, but we will keep going and moving forward so that we can make sure everybody by the end of the year is in a situation and hopefully well before the end of the year, but everybody is in a situation where the children are learning and the teachers are comfortable with what they're doing. I asked a question at Capitol this afternoon that um, I would like to repeat here, and that is, we are working to make the classroom up to the level that, of the classrooms, that they are up to the level that they are safe. And what happens if we reach a point where there are classrooms that we can't really bring online for whatever reason. It may be old, it may be that the systems in there are, are not workable. What, can, can we have some um, assurance that there will be enough space for all of the students, enough safe space for all of the students? Um, I think that's a question that we have to be able to answer when we actually finish making these rooms what they need to be. Will we be able to accommodate our entire um, number of students? And if not, where do we go from there? Matt, did you want to respond? You had your hand up. That's why I'm calling. <laughs> I, I did. I, I just um, needed to uh, unmute first. Um, yeah, Barbara, that's definitely the goal, and you, you know, we're going to make sure we can do it in, in each space. And then with the social distancing um, and how we how we modify that, it might modify how we how we use the program. So we, we should be able to get that the answer to that that question with with scheduling and our and our enrollment. Um, w w now that we know what the what the plan is, is, is going to be. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody wants to stay hybrid, you know, for any longer than, than we have to. So like Dr. Marini said, we're we're going to be working towards getting there as quickly as possible and, and with the utmost confidence that, it, that it's going to be safe. Uh, and I hesitate to use that word, that it's going to meet the, the high standards uh, that, that, that we expect for our students and our staff. Thank you, Matt. Who else would like to speak? or ask questions or make comments. Araya. I have a question, which is just um, a clarification, which is in Capitol this afternoon, we heard, um, I thought that um, Charlie um, expected that the ventilation in the buildings would be, um, would be at least the building level ventilation would be in place by September 16th but we didn't hear that tonight. And so I'm trying to find out what. I, my understanding is that that is his goal. We don't know 100% that he will get there because he doesn't know what he will find. I mean, he knows the buildings in general, but the ability to bring them all up to the level that we want to bring them up to or through the, portable HEPA filters, um, that, that's the question. So I think, I think we sort of need to be a little bit patient and allow him to do the work. We'll know more in two weeks when we get back together in Capitol. And things can be, in my opinion, and I don't know if you all agree, we can revise things as we know, have more information. Of course, and I think it's important um, we all know that at any point, anything happens, a building, you know, a pipe bursts, whatever. But I think it's important for the public to hear that that is the goal, is that it's by September 16th. I mean, that's, I think, a, a, an opportunity for celebration of the all the work that Matt and Charlie have been doing and their teams to, um, to get these buildings, the ventilation where it is. And... Um, and the other thing that I thought was exciting that I heard at Capitol, and I just wanted to comment on it, um, was that, um, and I can't remember if it was you, Matt, or Charlie who said this, but basically 
that um, when this is complete, the buildings will be the safest and best ventilated, ventilated place um, that a person can be. Um, it, they'll well exceed the ASHRAE standards and they will um, be reaching the rigorous standards that Joe Allen and the Harvard team put together, which are basically double um, the, um, the professional standards, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that, so I think it's like, and it's an opportunity for everyone to realize that teaching from classrooms, being in these spaces um, will be some of the best ventilated spaces you could be at, better ventilated than your homes, better ventilated than anywhere else. And so I found that incredibly reassuring um, and wanted to share that. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. I, I, my own, okay, I, I just wanted to reinforce what Mariah was saying. There's a, there's a study out of California when they did a similar thing in their buildings and the student achievement rate went way up. Kids were learning at a much higher rate when they were breathing uh, cleaner air, uh, for lack of a better word, fresh, nice, clean air, and their learning rate went up. So there is a, there's, there's a benefit that goes beyond uh, what we've been talking about now, a real benefit. Yeah, and that's benefit for life. Joe Allen had said that during his presentation that fresh air is something that you can never get enough of. And so this is a real um, blessing in disguise if we get this going and have this right. improved ventilation that's thank the, you that's, that's the plus part yeah yeah <laughs> who else who next who would like to be next david yes i have a couple questions mainly for casey so she referenced that the higher the number of minutes on someone's iep the likelier that they would be counted among the estimate of 300, and then there are also mentions of some of the other groups that fit under the most vulnerable designation. Uh, so I would like to know, for example, how economically disadvantaged will be defined. Uh, at the last meeting, there was a mention that it might be for students who are on free and reduced lunch, uh, but I, I think that number is probably greater than 300. So I, I'm just wondering if we could uh, maybe get some more explanation around how these terms are being defined since we're talking about metrics more broadly? Yeah, that's, sure. that's good. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I again, I, I wanna stress that what has been listed on the slides is not just solely that one category and we're pulling a thousand kids from that category. So there's certainly some overlap. So I wanna just put that out there because we're, we are bringing back our most vulnerable that doesn't ignore the fact that we do have other vulnerable students in the district. So I wanna just say that outright. The second piece is um, we are working with um, our Steps to Success coordinators to identify um, students who are um, uh, uh, in public housing um, and also um, students who we know are from uh, uh, low SES backgrounds who may not necessarily qualify for um, public housing, but we know through our principals and our guidance counselors that they are families um, <clears throat> uh, in need. So I, I don't know if that answers your question in terms of how we are looking to define economically disadvantaged. All right, that helps, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, uh -huh. Then also, in terms of where these students would physically go, has that been determined yet? Uh, would they so, be in local school? Great or? question. Yeah, so we discussed uh, uh, a couple of options. One was we know that the uh, Ridley School is um, being the newest. Would uh, we considered having uh, all of those students start there? And then in talking to the principals, one thing that came up was because we are rapidly trying to bring back students, the number of transitions that these kids would have to make in such a short amount of time wouldn't make sense. And so instead, what we um, have landed on preliminary anyways, is to bring students back to their home schools. They're familiar with the spaces. Um, hopefully it will be with the staff that they are already familiar with um, and to see students that they already know. Um, so. Uh, right now, the plan is to bring all of the students back into their class, uh, uh, their home schools, and then we would essentially create pods um, to keep everybody uh, in cohorts and keeping with the um, safety regulations. 
I thank you. And then a question I have for Matt. There was a reference that perhaps kindergarten could be ready to start very soon. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, we received uh, a 100 air, air purification systems got delivered today. They were they were supposed to be shipped today, but we actually got them this afternoon. So I can say with confidence we can deploy those um, in, in the kindergarten classrooms and be ready to go for kindergarten on, on September 16th. Um, hopefully we'll have some more units in and we can uh, move into a first grade and, and other areas. We've also uh, ordered uh, additional furniture so that uh, the students can have the individual uh, seating in the classrooms. It, it may look a little different as one kid may be at a two person table or a four person table and another kid may be at a desk, but we'll be able to, to space the kids uh, appropriately and 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 give them the, the appropriate size uh, furniture other than some some kids might be at a, at a table and some kids might be at an, in, at an individual desk but we can make kindergarten work thank you so perhaps this is a question for Jim but as part of our vote tonight assuming that both uh, beep and kindergarten would be back in the buildings by September 16th yes. All right, thanks, that's good news. And then my uh, last question for this round would be around outdoor learning. I am very much appreciative that the principals and you and the central office have given uh, more thought to developing a uh, fixed scheduled outdoor component to in-person learning. Uh, I'm wondering, is this a commitment for all grades and it'll start early enough in September so that students have an opportunity to meet their teachers and their classmates? I think I can say with confidence, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll begin right away uh, and that it will be designed so they can meet their teachers and they can, uh, uh, you know, do the uh, meet and greets and, uh, and get to see each other and some of the social emotional stuff, that kind of stuff. I, I can't say there'll be a sort of like an academic program all planned. At that time, I think that's a little a bridge too far because I haven't spoken to the teachers and they and they have to work that out with the principals. But the principals definitely understand that I mean, they want the kids to meet their teachers. They and they, and they want to they want to set that kind of environment up in terms of kids being able to uh, uh, to to get together and and be you know to be school to be with each other and to talk with each other socially distant with the teacher. And so it, it'll be more informal then it will be formal, but then we can, uh, we can, we can go from there once planning can start. All right, I appreciate that. But just so that the community feels comfortable, uh, the yeah. intention is for this to apply to all grades. So that part is not necessarily a phase in, in the sense that all no. grades will have access to this outdoor component yeah. that's ongoing and regular. Yeah, we, uh, I, we, we talked, I spoke with principals about sort of the concept and some of the things that and I'm, I'm talking in concept, some of the things that they will be able to do using the outside area. And again, I'm going to say it. The original idea for this actually came from the teachers who said they wanted to meet their students and they wanted to have outdoor uh, spaces for them to be able to do that. And um, so, yeah, it will, it will be at all grades uh, and it's, it's, it's going to take a matter of, of planning, but it will be at all grades and uh, we'll figure it out. It's just that the formal teaching that's happening out there, I can't speak to that, but I can speak to meet and greet, bring the kids together, have them feel like they're with their uh, classmates, they're part of school, there's a little school spirit. Uh, if I had my druthers, we kick up the band and we feed them, but that's, uh, that's another thing. Who else would like to go next? That's it, we wanna call the vote, Susan. So I'll ask just a couple of questions. First of all, again, thank you for the work that must have been going on late hours, uh, weekends uh, to make this happen. So I, I have some comments, but I just need to ask a couple of questions first. Um, so first of all, I think there are, we're, it would be helpful to be clear when we say things like, we're bringing kids back full time. If we are committing to full time learning and instruction for all children or only for children who are in person? 
um, because there's we have hybrid, we have some in person, we have remote learning academy. So uh, it would be helpful to have some language that we're agreeing to that this is a commitment to full time instruction for all children, not just the ones who are in the building. Is that right? This is full time instruction for in person beat whatever their full time hours are kindergarten, whatever their full-time hours are, and the uh, vulnerable students. The ones that are in, uh, uh, we're not in hybrid yet. Uh, when, when we're in the remote, it will be, uh, in the remote part will be, um, it will be a school day, right, Aaron? Did we, yep. did we, did we schedule that a school day, right? Yep, a school day. Yeah. But that's full-time instruction for a school day. I just want to make sure we're clear about like, because I want to make sure that it doesn't sound like, unless unless this is the intention, which I hope it isn't, that if you're in person, you are getting more education than in a hybrid model or a remote academy. So if we're saying that all children, whether they are in person, hybrid or remote learning academy, are going to get a full day of instruction, whatever that day was for them, because they have different hours, BEEP has different hours from K-12 and 9-12 is you know, a big, you know, it's very different, but I just, I, I'm not sure I'm hearing, I want to make sure I don't want to, I'm not putting words in someone's mouth. I think I want us all to agree. Okay. On, on I, 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 if, I know you're not saying this, but let me say it. We do not want students in front of the screen six hours a day. Uh, we, we do not want that. So when you say a full day of instruction, some of that day may be spent on independent work. Some of that day may be spent on a project. It's, it, it may not be directly with the teacher. Uh, in, in many ways, it's, I mean, if you were in a, uh, if you were a student in high school, you, you, you may not be in class every minute of the day. You may be in a tutorial, it may be in a, a directed study, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, I, I don't want to be misleading here that when we're in remote learning, uh, the students will get their program, they'll get a full program, but they're not going to be in front of the screen the whole time, and they're, and they're not going to be scheduled from uh, whatever time they start, 8 o'clock in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. By schedule, I mean they're not going to be scheduled with a teacher doing that necessarily, because there's going to be some independent work time and then uh, come back and, and work with the teacher. It's going to be that kind of thing. So let me say this uh, to, to, to maybe set this in, a, in the right track. Suzanne, I hate to do this to you, but, uh, and to David as well, but maybe we add that to the, to the uh, meetings we have every time when, in terms of, it's not just a check-in in terms of the facility. And are we ready to move more kids in? Are we ready to move, move more kids in? But it's a check-in in, in terms of the stuff I think that uh, Susan is re uh, referencing, the quality of education. How, how, how are we perceiving that? And how, because somebody actually said in the calls, where's the, uh, um, I don't think he used the word accountability, uh, but the quality control right. in terms of the, of the instruction kind of thing. Yeah, and I think if we're, it would be very helpful, I think, to have some, late, I think this is a big source of parent anxiety, which is yeah. that their kids are not going to get, they're not going to be going at the same pace as, kids in the building or whatever. And so I just think that to the extent that we are committing to, whatever it is that we're committing to be, equi you know, be, be equitable across all, you know, uh, across all learners. So for example, you're absolutely right. You know, during a, a six and a half hour school day, they are not getting direct instruction for six and a half hours during that school day. They're probably getting direct instruction for three of the hours. And then the rest of the time they're walking around the hallway or they're eating lunch or recess or transition time or yeah. small group project. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on during that six and a half hours. But I think we need to be able to say to parents, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me we need to be able to say to parents that regardless of the format, your children will be proceeding at the at, at the same pace if you will however we figure that out but it's not going to be some like there's a different third grade experience if you're in the building or you're hybrid or you're remote like that's going to be really problematic i think yeah yeah and, and and michelle i don't want to step on your toes here but i would say that one of the things that uh, parents are going to receive is for lack of a better term is like a syllabus this for this course this is what students are supposed to know and be able to do and this is what the program consists of and it it's in many ways 
it's not much different than if you were in the brick and mortar school. Uh, the, the, the distance learning, I don't think distance learning, this is my own personal values here, are going to be as good as actually being in front of the, in, in front of the teacher. I, I, I think being in front of the teacher is where the juice is. But in terms of the curriculum, it's, it's already memorialized. It's already been written in terms of it aligns to the frameworks. It identifies the standards that students are supposed to achieve at each grade level. So when, and when you talk about third grade, third grade in school A is the same as third grade in school B, which is different for a lot of school districts. They don't do that. But in this environment, we have to have a coordinated curriculum so that uh, you'll pardon this. I say it a thousand times. A Brookline education is a Brookline education. So the third grade program is a third grade program. And the teachers need, will be coordinating with each other because they have the curriculum and that's what they're going to be teaching. But so there what? isn't a curriculum right now. So that's what I'm a little bit confused about. We've never had a curriculum. So we had learning expectations, which were more or less voluntary. That Yes, they were from the state, but I would hazard to guess that they're considered they're not considered gospel. We're trying. We're, we're trying to. Uh, uh, we're trying to get a, a shift on that. Okay. And we're trying to get a shift that says we have a, what I call an articulated and a coordinated program. Okay. An articulated program is vertical. That the grade before and the grade succeeding, they have to know so that it's a continuum. It's not a. It's not a fourth grade education. It's pre K twelve. So what's happening before? What's happening after? And what the kids need to know. Uh, in order to progress to the next grade in terms of uh, know and understand. So that's the co that's the articulated program. Then it has to be coordinated so that the, the across the district, the teachers agree to this. No one's telling them what it is. The teachers and the department heads and the program leaders under Michelle's direction work with the uh, teachers to decide and determine this is the you decide. This is the fourth grade math program. And the teachers agree to that. This is what we think kids need to know and be able to do in math in grade four. Does it tie to the frameworks from the state? Yep. Does it address the standards that the state says? we? Yep. It addresses the standards. It addresses the frameworks. The teachers have decided what the actual curriculum will be. Once they agree to that, by extension, they all agree to teach that curriculum. So it's it's articulated, it's coordinated. It's a little new for Brookline, but that's what's going to have to happen. So, so again, I think I, I I would not. There's it may be true that going to a common curriculum is going to be a far bigger change for Brookline than going to a half a day online or something. Mm -hmm. I think that the the notion of teacher I and mean, Helen snickering, but I, you know the notion of how long it's going to take educators to come up with a common curriculum. It might take a year and okay. I, I just I and the only reason I'm sort of pushing on this point is that I think the major thing that we have to convey to parents and educators is that this needs to be as equitable an experience as possible there's not going to be some massive disparate number of instructional you know synchronous live instructional minutes there's not gonna be a massive disparate number of you know where the kid gets to by the end of the year so if we're willing to say that which I think we should I think we need some clearer language in this letter, like now, that we yeah. can, before we send it out to 8,000 families or 6,000 families, because I think that's, it, to me, that's a very important piece that uh, just the commitment that we're making is important. So yeah, great, Michelle, great let's let Michelle jump in. She really, she's okay. really chomping at the bit here. Go ahead, Michelle. This is my jam. This is where I get excited about the work. So I, I just want to assure people that one of the things we learned at the end of the the spring was that it it was really hard a lot of times because teachers weren't necessarily in the same place in the curriculum it was hard for families it was hard for teachers and i think we've all learned a lot from that so prior to the summer we had the curriculum coordinators work through a research-based protocol to sort of identify what were some very high level um, high leverage standards that we would want to put into place for all students to learn. When we went through the summer, teachers have been brought in on that process. So they are helping make those decisions and the, helping us determine, did we have the right standards or did, or did we miss? And in some places we have some adjustments. We're at the point now where we're bringing those documents together so we can get them out to families and, and to teachers in a nicer format as soon as possible. So I think there's a lot of buy-in with having teachers been 
be part of the process this past summer and, and looking forward to being, um, allowing them also to collaborate more easily in their planning. But, Susan, you're on mute. Go ahead, Jim. I, I, just, I just want to go to Susan's point just a little bit. Uh, uh, I mean, her comment that we need to get that out in the letter right away. I'm not sure that it's in the kind of shape that we can uh, put that out in the letter. You know, is that right, Michelle? Correct. The curriculum coordinators, because they're, they're working through next week and even a tiny bit into the week after to complete their work with teachers. And I want to make sure that they have that opportunity that, and that it's teacher facing before it's in the hands of a parent. Wait, what, sorry, what is teacher facing? The documents that, that memorialize the curriculum piece that we're talking about. So they've been working on it all summer and as they make adjustments, we have to make adjustments to the documents. Right, I'm definitely not suggesting that the curriculum be sent out to the parents. I think though that we need to be able to send the commitment that we are now using words to describe. Mm -hmm. Yes, which, yes it can go or yes it can't go. I, I would say it should be shared with parents as well. Okay. Oh, you mean the commitment? No, I'm really, I, I think I'm asking a simpler question. For sure, there isn't gonna be a curriculum we're gonna send to parents. We probably won't even have learning expectations. Maybe we will, but certainly not right now. But I do think that to the extent that our intention is to commit to a, an equitable learning experience for children across this district, and that there will not be inequitable instructional time or whatever it is, however you wanna frame it, I think we have to say it's, it's a couple of sentences now and it says more information will be coming out as we develop it. But I just think that that commitment has to be clear and has to be communicated to the parent that that is one of our design principles. That's, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it, it makes, it absolutely makes sense. So let's do a team back on that, uh, Michelle, and we'll, uh, and, and we'll figure out how we're going to communicate that the spirit of what's being said makes absolute sense to me. Right. That's what uh, I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm, I'm thinking perhaps uh, to put Jennifer on the spot as chair of the curriculum, to, a subcommittee that she will be working closely with Meg and with Michelle and reporting out on a regular basis to us as well. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, I, so that all comes together. So we actually have a liaison team from school committee working with uh, Michelle and, and Meg. Okay. Last question, I promise. As we think about, um, as we think about inclusion, I, I, I know we've talked about this a few times. I haven't quite heard how we're going to do this. I mean, there's a, you know, one way to read having only children who are, have significant IEP needs, low income English learners, having them be in an um, essentially separate program um, is that that's, that's complicated. So I think it would be helpful sooner rather than later to explain not only from a social emotional point of view, how those children won't be stigmatized, but also how their how their education will be a true inclusion education, given the fact that they will be in person full time and other children will be hybrid. And I just, you know, it's like, oh, well, those are the kids who are, you know, X, Y, and Z. So at any rate, I just, I think that needs more clarity. I don't know if, what the CPAC parents have had to say about that piece of this, but I think it would just be I, I, it'd be helpful just for me to understand what our current thinking is. So when we pull the most vulnerable populations back, we will have students in special education and general education. So in terms of exposure to students who are without disabilities, there would be that interaction that's built in. Sorry, I thought we said we were bringing only high need students back. In no, the... no, nope. So it's high need students, it's students who are on IEPs, who are designated, I, who are designated as high needs on their IEPs. But we also are bringing in students who are um, from low income households. We are bringing newcomers back, students who are ELD level below two. So there was that slide that was shown earlier this week that listed five bullets. And these are groups of students that the state has asked us to prioritize coming back in person. These are students who are homeless. Um, I have them here, but 
it was uh, back to that conversation that I was having with David. So when we say most vulnerable, it's students who are in gen ed and students who are in special ed. But the gen ed students are vulnerable. Correct. We have some, we have, you know, without getting into too much uh, uh, breaking confidentiality, we have students in general education who are homeless. We have students who are in general education who are in low income housing. Well, of so course. I, Yes, yep. we've got hundreds of them. So, right. but I guess my question is, is if, if what we mean by inclusion is that they are with gen ed vulnerable students, but there aren't gen ed, I don't know what you call them, non-vulnerable students. I just, I, I'm, con I'm concerned. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, we will, I mean, what I can tell you is that we're going to do the best that we can in terms of grouping our most vulnerable first and bringing back our lesser vulnerable students while making sure that our, our most vulnerable kids, I mean, I think you're trying to slice it even more so. Um, and I, I, I can tell you that our plan right now is to address the most vulnerable first. No, I get that. I guess I'm trying to understand how, the, to the extent that we are bringing in students with high needs and students who are vulnerable, and what we're not bringing in is gen ed students who are typically developing, not vulnerable, however you wanna, however you wanna phrase it. Yeah. I'm trying to understand how we're going to do an inclusion model. I guess have the have the CPAC parents expressed comfort with this as a that this makes sense to them as a as an I have not heard model. anything and I think you know when you think about inclusion in the special ed world it's inclusion with students who are in general education regardless of their SES um, regardless of the type of housing they live in, um, it's about being with students without disabilities. Okay, and the and the and the we've talked to CPAC parents about this, and they're okay with this. That that makes sense to them as inclusion. I don't know what you mean by talking to CPAC parents, but I can tell you in terms of what's been coming through my emails, phone calls, things like that. I have not heard any complaints or concerns about access to inclusion. But if you're hearing it though, please do pass those along. No, no, I'm not. I guess I'm just asking. So, I mean, there's CPAC, so have, I'm, okay. So, so student, say, you can be included. So I just wanna make sure, because students with disabilities who are most vulnerable, who are coming back are not being isolated or grouped completely separate. What we're doing is that we are bringing in, inclusion is existing because we have students who are not uh, who are not on IEPs, who are not on 504s, but have vulnerabilities that are different, that are not considered disabilities. And when you group them together, that's an inclusive environment. Is it true that we may not have the wealthiest children who are the most typically, who are typically developing in there? Potentially. Right. I'm not asking for wealthy children to go back first. I, I, what I'm asking is, do we feel like the, and what I mean by the CPAC parents is the parents who go to CPAC meetings and meet with you on a monthly basis and have children who are yeah. affected by this. I just want to make sure that they find that this, this, meet, this is inclusion. Yeah. Right. So I, I spoke with Linda Monarch today and that was not one of the concerns okay. that were brought up. Okay. Okay. Um, Jim and then Barbara. Let me just see if this is helpful, Susan, that uh, I'm scheduling a meeting with CPAC uh, and, uh, and they're bringing in to, to uh, just to have a meeting with them and talk about what's happening in special education. And then uh, uh, we're going to have, you know, foreshadowing, but uh, the to, to, to bring a discussion of an update on special education at a school committee meeting. But the discussion with CPAC uh, we're uh, we're scheduling that I, the, the the chairs of CPAC have connected with me. You know that I think, and uh, and we're scheduling to uh, a time that they can come in and, and we'll review what's going on and listen to whatever issues they have. And at that time, we can talk to them about this as well. And and uh, and, and so at least they will be able to have some comments on it. But the state has asked that we uh, prioritize kids because the gaps in their learning become really exacerbated. That's why they're being prioritized. Barbara, did you have something you wanted to say? You're on mute, Barbara. I did. Um, I, have, I have some concerns about this for a different reason. I understand 
children on IEPs um, and children who are vulnerable in many ways need to be brought back first. But I think then you've added children who are living in low income situations. And I think that's, that's a kind of labeling. There are many children who live in the housing projects who are not particularly vulnerable, vulnerable, who have been excellent students. And I feel like we are labeling them in certain ways. Well, these are our lower income students. So it, it, it's a naming of them in a way that makes me not completely comfortable. I think we shouldn't be distinguishing we shouldn't be separating our students. Well, you know, you're the wealthy one, so you don't need to go back. Well, that you might have children in there who are more vulnerable than the low income ones. I mean, I understand why we're doing it, but there's a kind of labeling in there that makes me very uneasy about it. And I don't know how to get around that exactly because I understand why we're doing it, but it is putting them aside in a group that's different from the more heterogeneous group that we would normally have in a classroom. I agree with you, Barbara, and certainly labeling is really hard in this case. I would argue that by grouping, by expanding uh, outside of just students with IEPs, with high needs IEPs, we are providing a heterogeneous mix. It may not be your typical Brookline mix, but it is heterogeneous in that we have students with all abilities and students with different backgrounds and students coming from different um, living situations. And these are both students with and without disabilities. Yeah, I, I just, I understand that, but I think we need to be very careful about how we describe that group because as we have been describing it 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 sets them up as oh yes they need they need more um they need that we need to make sure that they get all of these things and indeed we do i'm not denying that but i think it's hard when you put a child in a group and that child labels himself or herself. Oh yeah, I'm 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 one of the low income students. I this is why I'm here. I don't know. It just it makes me a little uncomfortable. I'm I understand why we're doing it, but it makes me uncomfortable because of the labeling issues. Yeah. Jennifer, did you want to say something? Oops. Um, yeah. I, I guess I think I actually want to really start out by thanking Superintendent Marini and the team for an incredibly um, thoughtful and uh, plan and the being very reflective, working incredibly hard. Um, Superintendent Marini, you have come into a situation four or five weeks on the job um, that is incredibly challenging and difficult. There is so much going on. And so I really want to thank you for your hard work and for the whole team, an incredible amount of hours. It's really, really um, amazing. The amount of time that we've spent talking about the health and, health and safety of our buildings to make sure that we're ready for students, I think is just um, amazing. And I, and I really hope that we can um, move forward with our planning on the actual instruction now, if we can, if we can sort of get some things laid out tonight. Um, I'm very excited about that. So I really want to thank you. you. You come into quite a situation uh, willingly. And so I thank you for, for, for coming and joining us on this journey. Um, I want to, um, I, I have a question that's a clarification because I think I, I pretty much understand um, the plan as it's being laid out. And I, I am interested in bringing students back into the building, you know, when it's safe to do so. And according to the benchmarks that we've sort of laid out and we've gotten some um, information from our advisory panels. And um, I have a question sort of uh, more about the remote learning piece. We've talked about the remote learning academy and it's, it, um, could you just clarify, could someone clarify for me, is that sort of a dis different decision track versus 
um, us starting remote, bringing kids back in when we can and going into a hybrid mode. Um, we've had conversation in the past where there would be sort of a decision point for families, like we're gonna start remote and if we can bring you in hybrid, we will. When we can, we will. Um, but th is there uh, an option then to sort of separate and say like, no, I'm, I'm gonna stay remote or do families need to opt into that right from the beginning? Um, and so if, I, I think it's kind of a, a very specific question, but I just wanted to clarify that so I could make sure I could explain it to community members. Um, so that's one piece. I guess I'll say them all at once and we can come back to that question unless you want me to stop. Maybe let him answer. Yeah, okay. okay. Go ahead. So can, answer. can anybody sort of, do we have a, a plan for that piece that we could clarify? Maybe Erin, I see. Erin? Yeah, so um, I can clarify a little bit, which is different than what we presented on Monday. So I understand. Um, a little bit of confusion um, that's happening. So in thinking about the Remote Learning Academy a little bit more, um, we have decided to start that program or we're, we anticipate starting that program at the beginning of the school year, so September 16th. So families would need to decide um, when we send that form out in the next week or so um, to families in order for us to like, have appropriate planning for staffing and for students, um, not only in the Remote Learning Academy, but also in our other schools. Um, so we know approximately how many students um, each teacher will have in their classroom. The other reason we decided to change the date to the beginning of the school year instead of making that choice point um, you know, when your, when your grade level classrooms are ready, is just to keep students consistently with the same teacher um, throughout a, this period of time, instead of having them start with one teacher, potentially make a decision about going hybrid or not, and then moving to a new cohort of peers and a new teacher at some point during the fall. So those were a couple of things that we heard in the feedback from all of you and from um, some other constituents after Monday, um, which is why we made a slight change. Could you, uh, thank you for clarifying that. And then what might it look like if um, we need to say, say, the, say the state metrics change, um, you know, in our, our transmission rate in the state or in the county, you know, fluctuates or flu, cold season, lots of like possibilities down the road that may or may not happen, but just to sort of think about the seamlessness, um, what might happen? Well, I guess the teachers that are providing the hybrid service would then just provide the remote learning. I think I've answered my own question. Um, so, okay, so so that's great. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I do want us to um, think about, um, and, uh, and perhaps this is something we can continue to talk about in curriculum subcommittee in the future. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, to think about how we can meet the needs of students on IEPs and 504s to help um, make accommodations for when they're in the remote learning part of a hybrid program and to sort of really just be thoughtful about the needs of those students um, and, and what we can do and, and just start thinking about that now as we plan for remote learning. Um, you know, I think we really need a, a strong focus on remote learning um, to be a really rigorous program with lots of synchronous learning opportunities for students. And some students are going to need this because they or their families may need them to choose this option. Families just be, are more comfortable with this option. Um, and that the possibility that we may need to all go remote at some point. And that, you know, that's a possibility. We hope that doesn't happen, but it might. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I, I'm happy for us to continue the conversation about quality of our, of our educational program and whether it's hybrid, remote, or in-person. Um, in curriculum subcommittee as we as we continue the school year. Um, so I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'll say I'm excited about about the the possibilities of um, of what the team has laid out for us. Um, I, I think that it's great that we can get people into the buildings if our buildings are safe. I'm, I'm really appreciative again of how much time we spent on talking about ventilation and how seriously people have taken it. Um, you know, and I think I mentioned this in Capital Subcommittee, I really want us to have, and I'm sure that that's part of it, and I think it's probably part of the blueprint already, um, to think about how we can help students learn safety protocols, like the proper way to take a mask on and off, um, to reduce transmission, to think about, um, we talked about like, you know, bathroom sort of etiquette, you know, like just trying to reduce touch points and things like that. 
um, so that we can keep students healthy. And I think that's what it's really about for me. I want students to go in and be healthy, to, to minimize or mitigate the risk as much as we can so that students are safe and so that they are not um, spreading COVID and, and bringing it back to their families because that's what I'm really concerned about, um, the people who take care of them when they're at home. Um, I don't know. So I think, Suzanne, that's it for what I have to say for right now. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. I just want to say uh, in some of the, uh, the panel meetings, they have talked about uh, creating signs and posters and, and videos and, and helping teachers come up with some of these protocols that we will teach the kids. Yes. And, and, and I think there was also some, some conversation about um, sharing those with families so that we yes. can begin the education ahead of time so that students will be ready sort of to, to hit the ground running ahead of time with these yes. sort of videos and instructions. And that just came up. Yeah, that's a good that's idea. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Sharon, did you want to ask a question, speak, make a comment? Um, one second. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, I can. Um, so I, I think I have two uh Two general, like one question and then like um, one sort of general area of concern. Um, probably like, I'm just gonna take off these headphones. I'm sorry, guys. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I am um, probably like a lot of families in the district. And I'm sorry, my head looks really weird. Um, <laughs> Um, but like, uh, so probably like a lot of families in the district this week, like me and my spouse sat down and we thought about what was facing us when we were looking at either a hybrid or a remote learning model. And we did a back of the envelope calculation based on, you know, an increasingly realistic appraisal of like workload, student responsibilities, time at home, things like that. And um, just to put a number on it, because we're sort of analytic like that, um, my spouse and I figured that we're looking at probably um, between uh, 12 to 15 hours per week per child minimum for in-school support. Um, now, I have three children, right? That comes out to about 36 hours a week for all of our children. Um, my, I'm fortunate to have a spouse who's going to provide me with some, you know, we'll work together on this. But even still, um, we are very much looking at um, supporting either of these educational models as being a full-time job. Um, and while I have heard in the panels a great deal of discussion about the essential role that households play in making this thing work, this conver that conversation has not featured in any of these discussions to date. It keeps getting pushed off. The stars of the show keep being the principals, the administrators, the teachers, and the kids, okay? All, you know, reasonably correctly so, but just to be clear, this system does not work without adults in households providing essentially the equivalent of full-time labor, right? To make sure that education is being delivered, okay? And I'm sorry that I've been banging on about this now for months, right? but the plan still isn't dealing with the educational delivery model, right? That depends on a whole critical mass of thousands of basically untrained and unpaid and from our emails, generally unavailable staff, trying to make sure that whatever the great content it is that we're delivering online actually gets into the minds and the hearts of our little people. And so um, I think that the question, I mean, this isn't my question, but like the plan is not complete. Um, in my view, without right now starting a robust plan with the principals, with the parent, like with the teachers, with the administrators, with the panels, and importantly, with the adults in the households, to figure out how to make that linchpin fit into a system that is not built to accommodate it or communicate with it or educate it or train it appropriately and figure out how to deliver what it has to deliver. I think that, you know, 
we're in real risk here. We're in real danger of like, um, you know, feeling comfortable because we're, we're hitting a lot of boxes according to guidelines and stipulations that are stipulations and concerns that are being expressed by educators and concerns that are being expressed by parents and science and a lot of things. But ultimately, kids are a part of households, right? There are adults in them. They are not ready to take this on at this time. They probably need a month's worth of training and a hell of a lot of logistical support. We're not talking about things like putting into place community-based pods, which when I raised them last June were laughed off as being unrealistic and are now actively being developed in urban districts all across the United States, right? School organized pods for people who are working in hybrid situations so that we can like address this sort of equity issue. So, I mean, I think that, I think that basically what I'm trying to say here is that like, I guess we're checking a lot of boxes. It's going to be really hard to vote no on the plan because we're checking so many boxes. Um, I want to give particular plaudits to Matt Gillis today, who did the magical work of, I guess, figuring out that you could reverse engineer Pierce's, you know, entire ventilation system in order to like change the entire flow of air in building. A I mean, like there is magic that is being done from like a science engineering and procurement perspective. Right. That, that, um, that wasn't me, but thank you. You're welcome. Who was it, Charlie? It's Char Charlie knows that system pretty well. I'm going to give that. And, and, and he's going to try it. I'm taking them away from you, Matt. Right. So, um, but seriously, I mean, there are like Herculean efforts that are being achieved here, but we need to see some of that being applied to communicating and engaging with these families because we're, I, I don't know if the public knows, we're receiving on average about 100 emails every four to five hours from families who do not know how they are going to make this work. They cannot handle this under the current circumstances. And they're not gonna be fine with like, you know, just like a, here you go, everything's gonna be great. We really promise everything's gonna be great. Really, really, everything's gonna be great. So just, you know, throwing in there like my own set of concerns and, you know, serious considerations about like how this is going to affect um, their lives, my life, everybody's life. That's one, that's the big piece. It's a missing piece. It's a whole missing leg of the table. The table's gonna fall down. Don't let the table fall down. That's my warning to you. Um, the other piece is um, there's been a lot of discussion today about special education. Um, I've raised before that we've been contacted by email um, as well as you know in person and via text message uh, by families who do not believe that the declines that their children experienced during remote learning are reflected in their IEPs and that pending placements on the basis of IEPs that do not take into account that information are going to enable their children to have academic achievement, to be academically successful in any way, you know, in the coming school year. So I think that what we actually need, I, I, Jim, I'm so grateful that you're gonna be meeting with CPAC. I think it's essential, right? But you know, one parent contacted me, you know, after our last, you know, quite a few conversations about special education in which we said, there's gonna be another meeting and we're gonna talk about special education. And you know, this parent contacted me and they said, you always say that there is going to be a meeting about special education and the meeting about special education happens and you're going to get to the point where you're going to vote on the plan and you'll never have had the meeting about special education and my kids plan doesn't reflect what they need for this new scenario either hybrid or remote you know that is a factual critique you know i don't know how many hundreds or thousands of children that critique pertains to or dozens or whatever i haven't heard a plan for going back through every single one of those kids IEPs and figuring out whether or not their plan is actually going to be adequate to enable them to function even at a minimal level you know in any of the scenarios that we're presenting hybrid remote whatever right um and so like I I don't know how do you say how do you say yes to a plan where like you know, the ability of 1,200 kids to access it may be in question, right? Like, what's the plan for, you know, the Office of Special Services to go back through and figure out whether or not 
kids' IEPs are consistent with the needs of the moment and, you know, making sure that those kids can access the curriculum on day one. I think it's great that we're going to, I, I share Barbara's, because Barbara, brilliant. I completely agree with you, Barbara, about what you had to say about labeling. I mean, the whole thing feels weird. It kind of sounds weird. It's like very uncomfortable. I, I don't really know what to make of this 300 person thing. I don't know where the number's coming from. You know, the populations that are being encompassed certainly seem to exceed 300. It seems really confusing. We don't know what the limiter on it is. It's, 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 it's really like mysterious. I don't know. I'm just really uncomfortable with it. But I think that the bigger picture is like, we've got 1200 kids who may not be able to access the curriculum on the 16th, you know, like, what, what are we going to do? You know, so that's, that's like, not a, critic, it's not a, is... like, it's a legitimate, it's a question. Like, what are we going to do yeah. between let's now? Let, and let's let Jim 16th. talk. He had his hand up. Per usual, Sharon, I, I, I think you make some really good points. Uh, the whole issue around how do we support parents who are in need of having some support, uh, even though uh, we haven't had those discussions here, we've had the beginnings of those discussions and trying to find out how to get the resources to do that. I do think that, uh, that you know, learning from what happened in the spring and, and, and people who are home and, and how to support people who are home is a pretty daunting challenge. But I think your, your, uh, uh, your warning is right. Don't let the table fall. And, and trying to figure a way to actually uh, connect with parents and support parents, uh, I, I, think that, I think that's well stated. And I think that point is well taken. Uh, I mean, exactly... I mean, it's uncharted waters for all of us, but I think your point is well taken, and I think it is something that, you know, when uh, when we can take a breath, that we should actually take a look at. It, it, I, I don't think it's the kind of thing that uh, we're going to have tomorrow, but as we say, okay, now we've made a plan, we're going forward, then there are going to be other pieces that we have to look at uh, m more directly than the shell, and that that is one, and, you know, I, I, I do think that's a, that's – Another place that you could ask, uh, you know, what are you doing about that? I think that's I think that's legitimate, and and so we'll have to go uh, put some things together and see what it is that we can do about that. Again, I think it's a valid, valid, valid point, and you shouldn't just have to wring your hands about it because it's like it's falling on deaf ears. So let me say that the other piece around um, the special education students and are they getting the services that they need in a remote learning experience? Um, I'm one of these people who actually thinks that when, when, when we sit and we talk with, uh, with CPAC, we should actually put that on the table and we should actually have some conversations about that with the people who are in charge of that organization because they certainly must hear it from pillar to post and get a sense that we need to join with them as partners uh, because you do know that a number of districts across the state had lots of complaints filed against them on special education. And because it, it, it's when you're trying to meet the level of, of need, that's a serious problem. I would say that the venue to have that discussion is with CPAC. And then we have to see exactly are the IEPs in this environment as the IEP as it's written. Uh, really going to address the needs of the kid because the the environment that the kid is in is different. So is the, is the IEP actually, is it still valid the way it's written? Now, if, if, you, if you go back and review all the IEPs, then uh, you're going to have to hire five more people. But I mean, it, it, the hard part is that you've, you've struck upon a couple of things that uh, have I would, I'll, I'll speak to myself on the parent advisory one. We, we've had uh, minimal conversations about it. It's an issue and it's an issue that hopefully we'll be able to put some energy into. And, and I, I think, again, just your, your warning about it, your admonition about that, that's good. Uh, that, that, but now we will have to, I hate to keep going to use Suzanne, poor lady, but that's going to have to come back at some point where uh, you say, to me, uh, we want to know what's happening in this area of the uh, of the school system. We'd like you to come back and tell us 
what you're doing about it. I, I think that's legitimate. It's difficult to actually have any answers in the moment, except to squirm a little bit because the points you're making are, high, are, are really good points. But to say, go go take a look at that and, and come back, put it on the agenda, tell us what you're doing about that. Tell us how you're thinking about that. I, I, I think that's a valid thing for you to ask us to do. And, and you, know, you have to ask us, but I, I, that's a valid thing if, if, if that's the will of the committee, because that's a piece that's dangling out there. It may be a linchpin piece too, by the way, but uh, then, we'll, then we'll come back and we'll report on the kinds of things that we're thinking about. And that will stimulate all kinds of discussions among us. Uh, and, and, and the IEPs, and are, they, are the IEPs adequate? That'll also uh, stimulate some discussion. And I think both of those are valid to ask us, uh, but, uh, but, but it would have to be, go back and figure this out too. And, and then uh, we'll go take a look at it and we'll do the same thing. It'll be an iteration back and forth until we say, and we wanna be in partners with the parents and we wanna be in partners with the CPAC so that we're not, you know, you know uh, when you think all your thoughts alone, you think they're all good ones. You know how that works. So it's good to have partners that you that you're doing this with. Okay, that's enough for me. Okay, I want to I want to come back here. I want to say like um, I I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, I uh, I think that one of the things that we need to be clear about here is that first of all, I don't think that this the right place to be having the conversation about IEPs is CPAC. Right, like they're an advocacy group, right? They, they can tell you how bad the problem is, but they can't tell you how to fix it. Like that's got to come internally, right? And that's going to involve, you know, the 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 scheduling appropriate, like the you know use of resources and prioritization, right? And so I just want to say, like I, I I'm not comfortable with that answer. Um, the parent piece I think is like a whole other level, right? Like I love parents, I am a parent. There are parents I don't love, whatever. Who cares, right? You're not going to get to like turning a, a workforce of 6,000 unpaid people into being effective educational delivery mechanisms by being menches, you know? Um, the, I, I, this has to be systematic. There has to be a deliberate, intentional parent engagement plan and structure that someone's in charge of, right? that somebody is taking the lead on. I also want to say, like I've spoken to teachers in other districts, right? They put into play, they had per, they had parental engagement. I'm so sorry about the noise in the background, but they had parental engagement um, leads based in central office. They adopted uh, software and apps so that, uh, so that teachers could communicate easily via text message with parents, okay? Teachers and staff were assigned a load um, of families that they contacted on a weekly basis or more if it was necessary because, you know, kids were struggling or had issues, you know, distributed of the district. Maybe it was seven or eight families per staff person. So right? Sharon, coordination and feedback mechanisms were put into place. I'm sorry, yeah. but like, you know, Sharon, when, when it, yeah. Sharon, these these are great ideas, and I know a lot of these came up in the panels that you have of the experts where they were going to offer this. So I, I would make a suggestion that you, you work, the, that the panel comes out with recommendations and uh, hand those over to Jim, and we'll see who the right people are. Because I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to address it. But I remember listening to the panel people, I don't remember which one, was it panel three, uh, offering to do videos to help parents and to give them t tutorials and that that would be helpful. And so I'm going to ask us to move on because we haven't heard from Andy yet and we've been at this for over an hour. So uh, let's give Andy a chance so he can speak and then we will move on. So Andy, I'm going to give you a chance. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. Um, I guess one problem with talking after Sharon is that often she'll, she'll have turned out to say uh, or some of what I had in mind to say. And regarding the second point about special education, I would broaden it a little bit, actually. It's not just about um, people who are currently on IEPs whose IEPs may now be obsolete. Um, it, there are also lots of people in the pipeline um, for IEPs and 504s whose, you know, who, that process just got interrupted on March 12th. And um, I think it would be good not to, you know, move forward without 
evaluating these people properly and making sure that you know they're not left behind just because of an accident of you know when the, when the virus hit us. Um, yeah, and regarding Sharon's first point about what this is doing to families, um, yeah, I tried to articulate this at the last school committee meeting on Monday, where I described it as. Well, remote learning is basically a staffing crisis that we are pushing out into the community. And I think we should think of it that way and devote the kind of resources to addressing it that we would, you know, a staffing crisis in our schools. Um, so I don't need to say more about that now. I guess I would go on just to offer an apology, uh, speaking only on behalf of myself. I mean, we all understand now that it was the ventilation issue that drove the switch from mostly in-person to mostly remote. This ventilation problem did not suddenly come to our notice between last Thursday and this Monday. All right, those who have been watching the meetings of our capital subcommittee and our expert panel number four, like they know how passionately we've all been working to get our facilities ready and get a grip on the ventilation problem. But right now it seems that we just won't have all that upgraded space ready to receive all of our students and educators by September 16th. And for that, I'm deeply, deeply sorry. Yeah. So that said, I'm going to support this plan because I trust you, Dr. Marini, uh, when you assured us personally in the strongest terms that we are pressing ahead with getting all those spaces ready for everyone who, who needs to be back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so uh, I'm at the end here, and uh, I, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, I've learned from Dr. Marini that we're, you know, we're not here to fight battles, but we're here to solve problems. Uh, and there are many ways to solve this problem, and this is one way, and Dr. Marini has, has uh, brought, brought forth this plan, and I will support it. I, I think there does need to be a lot of work, but he knows that, and the team knows that. I think we do need to think about our families. I think we do need to think about that group that's coming back, uh, whatever we call them, those 300 students. I think we do need to uh, certainly give support to our families that have children with IEPs. Maybe there should be a helpline or something available so that they can call, so that they, they know what steps they might take next if they need to revisit or amend their IEPs. That certainly is part of the legal process, and we could offer support with that. Um, but I, I also think that there's the, the saying that says you go slow to go fast. It doesn't mean that we should not feel a sense of urgency, but that we, as some of our speakers said tonight, we also need to be patient and uh, start uh, the road down, uh, bringing all our students back, but we're going to start where we know we have um, mitigated the risk the best that we can through the ventilation and through our other measures. Remember, there are other measures, uh, such as the masks and the social distancing. And as we start down that road and we bring people on and we see how well it works, it will be easier and faster to bring other grades on. So it's not as if it's going to take a long time to bring other people on. We don't know what that is. But once we get started, uh, we will know how that works and where, where the kinks are and where we need to make some adjustments. So uh, I, just to let you know, I will be supporting this plan and, and Dr. Marini and his team in this effort. Um, so with, with that, Mariah? Are we allowed to say our next comments? Yeah, let's do a, let's see if we can do this in 10 minutes so that we can have the vote because we still have more business today. So uh, everybody can have one more quick round if you want, but I, I will call it at some point. Can Go I ahead. talk? Okay. Sure. Um, so, so I would feel much more comfortable supporting this if there was an explicit asterisk on here somewhere that says the goal is to get grades one and two starting on September 16th as well, as, as well as grade nine. I feel like the transitioning to the high school is a really, um, it's a huge leap, right? And, um, and I, I really want us to, and that building would otherwise mostly be empty. And I don't, I don't want to, I'm not asking for this to be a part of the explicit plan, but again, this idea that it's an asterisk on there, that this is something that maybe when we meet next week, we'd have the opportunity to talk about and maybe get some updates um, within two weeks. To me, the 
it was so disappointing and frustrating to see the K2 in person walked back from um, two weeks or I can't remember, two meetings ago to, to and to see K come back is a great start. And I'd like to see one and two come back as well. But also again, thinking about ninth graders um, and how important that transition is um, to see if we can get them also back in their building um, on that first day of school. Thanks. I, no. Helen, Helen, you're on mute. I'll be very quick. I, um, I actually, I'm not sure in what capacity or how the high school is thinking about it, but I agree with Mariah. The ninth grade, if there's, because of that transition year and the difficulty of knowing what the expectations are in high school, uh, if there's any way of bringing them back, you know, for whatever way possible, in person, I think that would be a very important piece. It won't uh, keep me from voting for this because I think this is something the administration is probably thinking about anyways. Andy? Yeah, I guess in considering Mariah's proposal, I, I'd, I'd be wondering maybe if Matt could talk about like would prioritizing ninth grade in this way slow down, uh, slow things down for first, second, third grade um, or, or would they be sort of on parallel tracks that don't interfere? Uh, depending on what we can get in for portable air filters, it, it could be on a parallel track, absolutely. Um, st still working on it, uh, hoping to have some, some good news in, in the next couple of days. So, however, yeah, however, I don't know what the uh, implications are, the complications are around that at all. So I would, I, I would not be able to make that part of the plan and think that I can uh, would be able to to implement it. It's uh, I mean we certainly could look at it for further down the road or something like that. But to have it as an asterisk and part of the plan, uh, it just has been <laughs> there's been no work done on it. And these things have tails on them, and you don't know what the unintended consequences are going to be. So I would uh, respectfully ask that it's not. Uh, asterisk uh, attached to the plan in terms of the grades uh, uh, one and two I guess grades one and two that's th that is our goal that is part of what we're about to put a hard and fast date is you just don't know what the other complications are that are coming in and we certainly would want to hit uh, that date or close to what or whatever it's going to be but we can't commit to a date and having an asterisk on it, it just, you don't hit it. And then I, I don't know the, the purpose of the asterisk, except that there's, you know, urgency around getting the one and two in. I got that. But I think we all have that. And and certainly to, when the buildings of uh, ventilation is where it needs to be, we can move on it. I, I, I don't know what the purpose of the date is, except to put uh, a level of pressure on that is certainly not needed. But can I can I answer that? Which is, in my opinion, uh, we just heard from Aaron that families will need to opt into a model in the next week or two. And understanding that it's not a it's not a firm nothing is a firm commitment at this point, right? Like our cases could shoot up to triple, quadruple tomorrow, and we, all of this would not be happening. But the goal is to have again, it's a goal to have um, grades hold on a minute please sorry to have grades one two and nine and it's not a firm commitment i don't know if asterisk is the right way to put it i'm not saying it should be in the formal plan as voted um but that it's something that we that we have an affirmative goal towards and it's not just one and two but nine well if it's not if it's not uh, part of the plan then i would suggest you take it up on the other side of the plan and see if it's the will of the committee that you want us to go back and look at what it would be like to take the ninth grade in. I would not want to make it part of the plan. L let us have the plan the way it is. And you have the, uh, the first and second grade, you want to expedite that, that's consistent with the plan. The other is not. So if you want, if you want to vote the plan, then take that up as a separate item that, that sort of gives us some direction, the will of the committee, that's fine, then, then we can go back and, and look at that. But if you conflate the two, 
it's 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 going to make it's it's going to make it so it's it's, it's incredibly I'm happy, I'm happy to introduce a separate motion that the will of the committee is to to visit this okay okay so why don't we vote on the current motion uh which is on the floor and uh then we still have some other business we have to take care of and if mariah wants a second motion we could do that later so let's let's go to our vote um susan are we, sorry were we still doing another round of comments or where are we? Uh, no, I was going to go to a vote. I was going to call the vote. Okay, can I say a couple things? Sure. Okay. So I just I have to say I'm I'm very uncomfortable voting at this point. Um, not because we don't know everything, because we will never know everything. Um, and as I've said many times, lots of people want certainty, but nobody gets certainty. Um, none of us get certainty. So it's, it's not that, but there are a handful of really critical pieces about the actual educational model that we don't have and that I've been trying to raise for the last few meetings. And I'm, I'm concerned about that. And, you know, look, I believe parents when when you voice your concerns, parents are not trying to force teachers into unsafe buildings, you know, Parents are talking about sending their own kids into these classrooms, the kids that they would walk in front of buses for. So I kind of reject this false divide that some people see between parents and teachers. I think parents aren't asking things of teachers that they're not willing to send their own kids into. And I think parents are scared that their kids won't get the education and services that they need. And I think we have a responsibility to address that, not only the physical safety, but the, but the educational promise that we are that we're working to deliver for these students. Um, you know, at the same time, I believe educators, I take educators at their word. I believe them when they say that, you know, this is not gonna be a repeat of last spring. I hear your fear. I believe you when you say we need standards and benchmarks and, and all those things. And, you know, I think this has a, a number of implications. I mean, first of all, for, for students, I'm sorry to say that it means homework, right? And projects and grades and high learning expectations and final exams and all that stuff and musical performances. So there's a lot that it means for kids. You know, for teachers to deliver on that educational promise, it means a lot, right? It means to recommitting to our high standards for instruction and whole child development for, for every single child. It means being all in during work days and work hours and synchronous learning and flexibility about role and and being all in as sort of a team. And you know, for, for our part, the district has to commit to not asking teachers to do unsafe things. And we need to be able to put standards in place for them, you know, to do that so that we can all create as, as humanly possible sort of the educational experience that, that we want for our kids. And that's benchmarks and you know supports and everything. And so you know, I guess where I'm, what I'm struggling with is that, you know, in this, this is sort of a low trust environment. We've been hearing that for a long time. And for whatever reason, I just think the last few weeks have been more divisive, not, not less. And I know it's really hard to trust when you feel you've been let down, but, but I just feel like there's nothing else we can do except sort of, right, there's no way out but through. So, I mean, what it leaves me with is that, you know, we as the school committee have to trust the superintendent that all the things that he is saying are going to happen. We have to trust the educators that they are going to find a way to make this a, a powerful and equitable learning experience. And, you know, we, we're all gonna, we have to take fear seriously, right? Everyone has valid fears. Um, and, you know, we know from trauma-informed education that people who are facing a lot of fear can't learn, they can't perform, and they can't necessarily function sometimes. So you know, we need to take fear seriously, we need to take science seriously, we need to take education seriously. And, you know, the 1,509 emails, literally, that I've gotten, and probably you all have gotten in the last week, literally in a week, um, I think attest to various points in that. So I guess I feel very uncomfortable voting for this, mostly because of the educational side of it. Um, and I guess I would just hope that this is our very next task as soon as we do this. And I'm trying to practice what I preach and trust the superintendent um, and his leadership on this. Um, and that we're going to be putting together a pedagogical plan like ASAP for, for, for I'm now super concerned about the special needs discussion, but aside from that, for, for all of it. Um, and I really do hope that we can be clear about what 
what the promise is that we are making to parents and students and 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 educators and that we can we can be more articulate about that um as soon as as possible so thank you jim did you want to say something i i, I just wanted to say it, it uh it's, it's not a matter of matter of trusting the superintendent as as much as uh having a sense that we're on the right track all the pieces aren't filled out and what you're talking about susan is right on the money but it's not a matter of trust everybody that's going to happen we're going to have to negotiate an mou and we're going to have to do that in a way that uh, uh, addresses the issues that you're you're talking about uh, so that we can go forward with confidence and not just on a hope uh, and we do have a promise to the parents david so I do want to remind everyone that this plan that we're voting on is an opening plan. So it doesn't mean it's the final plan. It doesn't mean that everything is etched in stone and we cannot revise later. If it did mean that, then I would be very conflicted because I think that the plan to start with uh, BEEP and kindergarten is very sound based on the ventilation standards that have been articulated that were recommended by panel four and multiple experts who volunteered their uh, time and efforts toward giving these recommendations and I take them very seriously and I have comfort knowing that we are actively working toward improving the ventilation so that we can add more and more grade levels uh, primarily starting from the youngest children and moving up. Uh, I agree with uh, Mariah and uh, Andy among others that it would be a great idea to also try to get ninth grade to start as soon as possible, because that's a, a big transition year. My hope would be that the outdoor components, which seems to have advanced further, would also emphasize uh, ninth grade so that we can make sure that they're getting something very early on in the year, because that is a big leap from eighth grade to ninth grade. The one piece of this where I'm quite concerned is uh, special education, most vulnerable students. I think it's a little bit difficult to have a fully meaningful uh, conversation with the CPAC community if they don't know yet and we don't know yet exactly what general education might look like because that's an important piece to understanding the full ramifications of inclusion. I think when uh, Susan was speaking earlier about the different constituencies in the, in the most vulnerable group, I don't think she was saying that uh, some that these other groups are all disabled or have handicaps or anything like that. I think her broader point was about the importance of having a broad cross section of diversity because that's where you end up with meaningful inclusion. Of course, uh, English language learners, which are a part of the uh, most vulnerable under this plan, just because English is not your first language doesn't mean you're disabled. So I don't think anyone's saying that, but it does mean that we might not have the type of diversity to which we have been accustomed for inclusion models with special education. And that is a concern I share. Uh, Barbara articulated as well. Several of our members have articulated that. So I would hope that uh, if we pass this vote tonight, that we would revisit the special education uh, element of it and the most vulnerable uh, students element of it. I, I do remain somewhat skeptical that, it's, that we can really limit this to around 300. I think the number vastly exceeds that. And we need to have a really firm grasp of who is going to get into those 300 spots. In terms of the diversity piece, one consideration could be to see if there's a way to uh, bring in students from other groups by lottery, or I don't know what it is. I'm not going to go into details and micromanage. That's up for the administration to decide. But some other mechanism to try to diversify this group of people who we bring in initially so that it's really a broad cross-section of the community. I'm not trying to cast any aspersions on any particular individual when I say that I'm not fully comfortable with the uh, special education component of this plan. I know that people are working very hard and are well-intentioned and that are trying to identify groups that we generally feel uh, would benefit the most from assistance. But I do think we owe it to the community to think this out a little more fully. Uh, so I, I am going to support this plan, but with this uh, oral caveat that I do want us to continue to actively work on the most vulnerable student element. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Barbara, you've already had another chance, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call the vote on this uh, so we can move this along. So we have other business we have to do. So uh, we are voting on the plan as was moved by Helen and second by Jennifer. So Helen, yes. Barbara, yes. Jennifer, yes. Susan, yes. Uh, Sharon. Yes. Andy. Yes. Mariah. Uh, I'm voting yes, but I want to say that um, in my heart, I want to abstain, but I'm trusting Jim. No matter what Jim says about not trusting Jim, I'm trusting Jim. Sorry, Jim, but I trust you because this is on you. And I also want to say that I feel comfortable that what is we've talked about for weeks, this being the most important decision in front of school committees and school districts forever, that we're having the conversation cut off before people get all of their comments in. That that doesn't feel good to me either. Okay. Yes. David? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I vote yes. So it passed unanimously. I understand, and I'm sure Jim does too, that there are still lots of holes in the plan. Uh, I'm not trying to cut off conversation. I think we're going to have lots of conversation, both with the subcommittees and right here on the school committee. I know we'll have more conversation in the executive session. So uh, I'm sorry you feel that way, Mariah. That's not my intent. My intent is to move us forward. It's now 930 and we still have a fair amount of work to do. So we we'll still have plenty of time to um, give our input and, and I'm sure the public will do that as well. So thank you for the vote. I know it's a really difficult vote. There is a lot of work ahead of us and I really thank the committee for moving forward with, with Dr. Marini. He is, he is leading us and uh, he's gonna do it with our help, not, not alone. That's right. And so now the work begins and, uh, and really it, it's been a robust discussion, make no mistake about that. And we have heard you. Uh, and uh, the team that has been working on this have been just extraordinary, as you can see. And you've seen the reports over and over and over again. And whoever said it is right. Uh, I think, Jennifer, the, the people don't sleep. And the weekends have not been weekends. So, uh, and, and that's okay. Because, you know, we're here to serve and we're doing all that we can. You can be assured that uh, just because the vote has happened, no one's going to take a deep breath and say, good. Now we're out of it. Now people are rolling up their sleeves and saying, oh boy, now we have to deliver. And there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of hearts and minds we have to work with as well because we are shifting some of the ways that Brookline has done things traditionally. And we want to do that in a way that uh, people feel support. And so our work is still ahead of us. And uh, But I want to really uh, super thank you to, uh, you know, Casey and, and Aaron and Matt and and <laughs> poor Mary Ellen, who keeps getting hit up for money and says she doesn't have any, but too bad, Mary Ellen, we're coming at you again. You wait till tomorrow. And, uh, and, and Meg, everyone has been like outstanding. So thank you. I know it's a tough vote. Believe me, I know it's a tough vote and we are not going to walk away from it. Um, we hear you. All right. Helen, you need to do some business for us. Well, speaking of money, <laughs> That's actually, uh, so I, I wanted to just catch people up a little bit on our, because some people weren't at the Capitol subcommittee meeting. Actually, where, everybody was there, Helen, except for David. So, uh, you know, he needs to get caught okay, up. I can catch him up by himself, but people outside weren't. But the one, so there's two pieces I want to right, the, the public wasn't, right. Okay. One is to thank Parks and Rec publicly for being willing to work with us on using spaces uh, adjacent to the schools, some park area uh, to be in tennis courts, uh, basketball courts, uh, to put tents up for the schools. Um, they voted last night to do that and I thank them, but I also wanna thank them publicly for that. Um, I think it was you know, very generous on their part. And Matt and Aaron will be working together with the principals on where those are appropriate. The Tent, um, tents are, we have a quote and um, we already gave permission to uh, rent the tents. So Matt is going forward with that. There is the option to 
buy them for approximately 22% more. Um, and I think what I would do is not bring that up now for a vote, but wait to see how we're gonna use them and then determine uh, what we wanna do. We have time. They will manufacture them, we will get them. We can decide to buy them. Um, that's two, I'm sorry, there's three things. The third thing has to do with money for ventilation that we've all been talking about. Um, and Charlie presented us with a um, spreadsheet of the work that he wants to do in the next four weeks. And in order to get that done, and as we want him to get it done, um, he needs a, to be able to charge it to an account. Um, and the amount uh, that we, we, we did not take his whole amount that he put forward to us because it included increases in costs in electricity and gas, which at this point isn't necessary to vote. Uh, but what is necessary is the uh, adjustments to the HVAC system, the testing, the um, um, work that needs to be done for the nurses' offices to make those appropriate in the isolation rooms. And that totals uh, 465,000 approximately uh, dollars. Uh, and so I would like us to, we voted in the curriculum, in, excuse me, in the capital subcommittee to uh, uh, recommend to the full committee to appropriate this money. Um, and so I would like to put a motion forward to do that and then we can discuss it more. Do I have a second to the motion? Second. Who I the whole bunch of did you get somebody, Robin? The whole bunch of hands went up. Okay. Uh it's open for conversation and questions about the money, the vote for the money. Anybody have a question or a comment? Mariah? I just wanted to reiterate what I said earlier, which was I was so impressed by what Matt and Charlie said. Hold on, please. Sorry uh, about this and how it really will bring our bent buildings ventilation up to a an, an, an very Im impressive standard. And to build on what Mariah is saying, it's something that's good for us. All you know, this is not a you know something that we're doing and we'll get no benefit of. It continues to benefit us, you know, in flu season and all sorts of communicable diseases. Um, these, this having this kind of ventilation, and in in learn in terms of learning, because we know that there's studies that have been done that fresh air uh, kids work better, adults work better in it. So, um, Andy, I would also just mention for those who aren't looking at the spreadsheet, it's a fairly granular plan. I mean, um, different school buildings are being looked at differently and having different things done to them you know, based on a, a pretty good understanding of their peculiarities. Um, anyone who goes to Pierce might be worried that people are definitely thinking about Unit A, and, and that's not the only space that's getting kind of special special thought. Yes. I'm, I thank you, Andy, for, for putting that in. And and I, I, think we, I think Robin may have sent to everybody the spreadsheet. Uh, but if she hasn't, I will make sure to do it. Um, okay. Okay, seeing no other comments, hands, or questions, we'll take a vote. Uh, David? Yes. Helen? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Susan? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Andy? Yes. Mariah? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we're ready to go into executive session. Um, so, motion to meet in executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A for the following purposes. Purpose three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Brookline Educators Union, BEU, Unit A, Unit B, and paraprofessionals if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the and I so declare. Uh, do I have a second to the motion? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, vote to go into executive session. David? Yes. Helen? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Susan? Yes. Sharon? 
yes, and I will note that we're, I think we're 18 minutes early for executive session. No, we're actually 40 minutes late, but that's okay. Oh, <laughs> Mine is nine o'clock. That's okay. Who's counting? Andy? Uh, yes. Mariah? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, so I would, um, Robin, do we need to leave and then come back in? Um, actually, so if you could just announce that you won't be returning. That's right. I always forget. Thank you. We will not be returning to open session after our executive session. And I'll be closing out this meeting and you have a separate link. Okay. So I just want to thank everyone for really the hard work is probably the hardest decision we've probably will ever have to make as a school committee. I know it's not over. We're, it's only the very beginning. And thank you to the public for being so uh, patient with us and being participatory in this, in this whole process. So we've heard from so many people and I know that there are passions on all sides and we are going to try to do our very best to plug the holes that we identified tonight and to make this work as well as possible for our students, our families, our staff, and our community. So I will see everybody on the other side, as we say. <laughs>